Hello guys welcome back to our YouTube channel, in this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto got harem with Fem Jashin. Part 2. If you want more awesome fan fiction like this don't forget to hit that subscribe button, so without wasting any time let's get into the video. Welcome to the Chunin exams finals. The Hokage announced from the booth above. Here our shinobis from various villages and countries will show their results through the three months intermission we gave them. The older shinobi shouted with a great smile as the crow cheers to their village leader. An impressive speech as always, Hokage Dono. A male voice sounded by the Hokage's left as he took his seat. The man wore a Kage robe with his hat having a green corner, unlike his Hokage counterpart with the kanji for wind on it. He wears a cloth veil over his face from the nose down, only showing his non-pupil green eyes. On either of his sides are two Suna bodyguards wearing grain masks. Thank you, Kazikage Dono. Hiruzen nodded. And I congratulate your children for making it to the finals. It is to be expected. The veiled man chuckled slightly. They are my children after all. Well we're here to see the genin hopefuls go up a rank. A man stated with a gruff tone. His skin is dark brown with bleached blonde hair set back in ten corn rolls. He has thin mustache over his lips and a goatee. His eyes are coal colored. He wears his kage robe with was accented with yellow lightning bolts like decorations that was open showing his well built and muscular body. He wears a set of dark purple shinobi pants and sandals. With him were two shinobi and one kanoichi. The shinobi at the Raikage's right is a dark-skinned man with a slightly bulbous nose, dark coal eyed that seemed to give a bored gleam and white shaggy hair which covers his left eye. He wears a high-collared, sleeveless black uniform baggy shirt with a left hem reaching, past his left knee with loose-fitting pants. He wears bandages on his wrists and a one-strap over shoulder jonin flak jacket. He has tattoo with a kanji of water on his right shoulder, as well as kanji for thunder on his left shoulder, showing the notion that he has a duo affinity to perform both suetan and ration type jutsu. Which this author should comment that it is not a very wise thing to show off. He has what seems to be a broad foldable cleaver-like sword strapped to his back. What a drawl. The younger man sighed as he rubbed the back of his neck. Surveying for any attempt against his village leader despite the fact that said leader can take on the hachibi to a standoff. The second shinobi stood by the buff dark-skinned Kage's left and looked about his late twenties to early thirties. He also has dark skin and a muscular build, as well as a bleached pale blonde hair set in eight corn rolls, and has a small goatee on his chin. On his right shoulder, he has a kanji form tattoo for iron, and on his left cheek, he a tattoo of a bull's horn, one above the other, from his left cheek up to his cheekbone. His top lip is slightly darker than his bottom. He wears oval-shaped sunglasses and a white-colored hitai aid of kumagakur over his forehead. He as well as his fellow bodyguard wears a one strap over shoulder jonin flak jacket but no shirt under showing his buffed right pectoral. He wears a red belt around his waist and hand and shin guards that are gray with red padded squares on them, shinobi sandals and a white scarf around his neck. He carried eight swords, four strapped to his back and the other four strapped to his lower back. This is an amazing show. We gonna show you how we go. Oh yeah. He rapped poorly getting a sad sigh from the lazy looking shinobi. Siding in the Kage's left armrest was the Kanoichi that accompanied them. She is about 17 and has dark skin, almost milk chocolate and green eyes. She wears formal attire consisting of a long-sleeved, high-collared black dress shirt that was open enough to show her cup-covered mesh shirt and skirt, along with a pair of gold-colored two-inch-long needle earrings and gray sandals. Her hair is gray and pulled back into a bun with two bangs that fall on either side of her face. Knock of the rapping, B the Raikage growled at his bodyguard as said man was jotting down his mad rhymes as he continued to mutter his raps. Ha ha ha. A man about his late forties chuckled. I like him pops. He's good. He commented. The man has red hair, mustache and bears which tapered off to a point. He wears a large headpiece consisting of three pointed crown like ridge, bearing both his awagakur hit I ate, a ring, and a prominent black piece of armor running across his cheeks and the bridge of his nose. He wears a long-sleeved light red shirt and pants, with a mesh armor shirt and fitted black suit underneath, along with calf-length dark gray sandals. Around his waist he wears a brown sash that holds a brown armor freest plate with a pouch in the front, a brown back plate that is connected to the front with mesh armor, and armor lapels falling to the sides. Rashi, you're too laid back. A muffled guttural voice grunted. You're also embarrassing our niece. A very tall man at least about seven feet in height was standing with his arms crossed. He is heavily armored, wearing red armor with seems to be a furnace on his back that gives off small thin streams of steam. He has light brown eyes, and his armor extends all the way to the bottom half of his face, covering it up. Underneath the armor covering his face he wears a white cloth which also covers both sides of his face and the top of his head. 
Aside his red armor, he wears a red Casa conical straw hat over the white cloth and seems to be made of the same material as the armor in his furnace. He wears his Awagaker hit I8 on a black cloth over his armor. He also wears a bronze colored ring round his neck which he wears over his armor. He also wears armored plating over his arms, torso, and his legs down to his shin. Oh come now, Han. Rashi chuckled. You're saying you can embarrass Kurochan better than I? He asked. Han's response was to allow a steam of steam to escape the cloth-like mask from the sides, showing his armor-plated mouthpiece that looked like an angry snarl that would be aimed at anyone who dare hurt their family. You're both embarrassing yourselves and our village with your wily banter. An old man grumbled as he sat on his large seat beside the Raikage. The man is short, very short old man in his late 60s to early 70s about 4 feet 7 inches. He has a triangular beard and a mustache that has angular corners, a big red nose and thick eyebrow. The top of his head is completely bald, although he has long white hair on the lower half of his head, which is styled in a traditional Chanmage haircut, the back of which is tied into a top knot with a yellow ribbon. He wears his brown kage robe over his green and yellow coat that has red collars. On his feet he wears sandals. NGOJ. Guritsuchi felt her eyebrows twitch uncontrollably. I don't know why she thought as she glanced to the kage box at her family. But I feel like breaking my uncle's neck, despite the fact that it won't do thing to them and melting my grandpa's balls, since he doesn't really need them. NGOJ. I feel a disturbance in the earth. The Tsuchikage shuddered as his sons did too. Looking nervously at his granddaughter he saw that her eyes were looking directly at his. Oh my. A female voice giggled in a sultry manner. It seems like some of you need to cool off. The tall, beautiful, and slender woman in her thirties is sitting beside the Tsuchikage. She has green eyes and ankle-length auburn hair into a herringbone pattern at her back. She wears a top knot tied in a dark blue band and four bangs at the front, two bangs being short with one covering her right eye and two long, one crossing each other under her DD cup bust just below her chin. She wears a long sleeve dark blue dress that folds just below her knees. The dress seems to be closed at the front with a zipper and is kept open on the front right side from the waist down. The dress only covers up to the upper part of her arms and the underside of her frieze. Underneath, she wears a mesh armor that covers slightly more of her upper body than her dress. She also wears a skirt in the same color, underneath those, mesh leggings reaching down over her knees. Around her waist, she wears a belt with a pouch attached to the back on the left, along with high-yield sandals and shin guards reaching up over her knees, dark blue polish on her fingers and toes. She wears a shad of purple lipstick. It would be best not to cause a war with them, Mizukagi-sama. A young man stated calmly as some of the bubbles he blew from his pipe were floating in front of the older beautiful woman. And a tall, thin young man he is. He has narrow pale golden eyes and brown hair that reaches to his shoulders. His side parting let a large portion of his bangs cover the left side of his face. He wore a long, light blue kimono adorned with a small emblem of three bubbles on the back and a pair of grey pants underneath, with an orange sash. The kimono hung loose, exposing his chest. In it, he carried a bamboo jug filled with a soap solution. Knock it off, Yudakata. Or else she'll lock you up in a room filled with salt. A calming female voice stated. Despite her height and childlike appearance, she is was an adult female, with a head of messy hazel gray hair with a ponytail that reaches to the small of back, dark pink non-pupil eyes, and what seems to be a stitch-like scar running from under her left eye, all the way down her cheek. She wears a gray, sleeveless shirt with a Karigakur hit I8 attached to the front short-sleeved mesh armor, over which she also wears a green poncho, along with a turquoise sash around her waist, paired with a green apron over the pants. She wears a pair of brown boots, and on her back, she carries a staff-like pole weapon with uneven-sized hooks with a green flower on the larger end. Now, now, Yuguri-chan, Yudakata-kun. The woman smiled although there was a heavy warning behind it. It would be wise that neither of you cause any trouble as well. Hi, Mizukagi-sama. The two stuttered albeit Yugura kept a stoic expression. It seems that I have arrived at the right moment. A young voice interjected as she came up to the VIP booth accompanied by five other. The one that spoke was a young lady about 15 years of age. She has silver-gray hair that has two bangs framing her face down to her moderate BB cup chest and rest tied in a royal bun and a few three sideways bangs over her forehead. She wears a white dress with blue and green accent, along with green elbow-length sleeves and white linen gloves that stretches to her elbow, her left seemed to adorn five different colored rings of a sky-blue sapphire stone, an emerald gem with an ocean blue center, a crystal gem with an ice blue fang center, a deep violet gem, and red gem with a purple center shaped like a spider's web. Each ranging from her thumb to her pinky in order. Her dress was wide and ballroom-themed and reached to her shins, showing that she wore green slightly baggy pants and brown shoes beneath it. Around her waist she wears a green belt that crosses at the front and seemed to give off her width of her waistline. 
Her emerald green eyes held an apologetic gleam as she gazed upon the older Shinobis. I am sorry for being late. She bowed slightly. The honor is all ours for gracing us with your presence, your highness. Saratobi bowed his head in greeting. I thank you for the welcome. She smiled kindly as she took her set beside the Mizukagi, and her guards took their position around her. The one that took her position at her right front is a teenage girl about 15. She has large sky blue eyes and brown hair that was set in two braided ponytails that seems to resemble ant-like antennas and a long cowlick from her crown over to left side of her head. She wears a one-piece blue knee-length dress with long sleeves that reaches to her wrists and a white front piece over the front of the robe and her D-cup hidden bust with a white large ribbon tied in the back and pale brown shoes. In her left earlobe is a sky blue sapphire earring. Na, na, Mishiro chan do we get to see a good fight? The bodyguard asks cheerfully. I hope my chan and Makoto chan get through. What do you think? The young lady sighed and was about to reply until her other bodyguard on the left of her answered. You should be more worried keeping the queen safe, Erika. She stated with a light frown. And I'm sure that both Makoto san and my san has reached far. The young lady that spoke wears the same attire as the other bodyguard safe for the color being green with three ocean blue diamonds on the chest, along with a red ribbon tied on the lower back. Her eyes are golden brown and narrowed sharp eyes. Her hair is dark violet with blue hints that are set in a two spikes short ponytails with two thin braids hanging from her neck down, past her hidden A-cup bust. In her left earlobe shines the same colored gemstone in the young queen's left trigger finger. Mo, Nina Chan's being mean the blue-clad young lady whined as her braids straightened out to a V. The Nodam should always be diligent of their surroundings, Meister Yumamiya. The woman about her early twenties lectures calmly from behind Erika. The woman wears a white shoulder-less top over her cup bust that stops just above her belly button, with a blue shin-length long sleeve jacket over it with white cuffs. She wears a pair of black leather low shin-length pants and dark blue shoes. Her hair is dark blue with a fringe over her right ear and another over right ear that's held back by a feather-shaped clip showing her left ear, along with her crystallized blue fang gem-shaped earring. Ara, Ara. A soothing voice interjected from behind Nina. Mitsuki-chan was like them about that time when we were younger and more innocent. Fufufufu. The voice belonging to a woman about her mid-twenties. She has light brown hair with two bangs going down to her shoulders, framing both her face and her cup bust, and the rest of her hair flow down her to her mid-back. Her eyes is light shade of red and a smile that looks both trusting and deceptive at once. Her clothing consists of a purple dress with a white front similar design to Erika's, and Nina's safe for not having a ribbon on the back. The shoulder pads are a bit puffed, and she wears a pair of knee-length grey women boots. You? Innocent. Another female voice chuckled. You're one to talk, Viola. If I recall correctly you weren't able to keep your hands off her when we were younger. The woman chuckled from behind the young queen as she passed her hand through her shiny red hair that reaches past her shoulder with a sword-like tip, three grass bangs over the left side of her forehead, and dark green eyes. She wears a green one-piece sleeveless dress that reaches to her thighs, and two long pieces from the front and back that reaches just past her knees. From over her cup bust down to her mid-thigh is the white front with a gold spider-like insignia over where her stomach should be. She wears a set of dark green ankle-length pants and a pair of dark green flat sole shoes. NGOJ. The Jonin rank shinobi stood there with a semi-bored expression on his face as he surveyed the Chunin candidates before his brown eyes and bit gently on the senban in his mouth. He wears a leaf hit I ate on his head like a bandana with a knot in the front, with some his brown hair sticking out of it at the sides of his face. He also wears a quartz-sleeved blue shirt with matching long pants and a pair of open toed blue shinobi sandals. He sighed as he noticed that only two genins were not here. And he did not like this. Okay you brats. He shouted. My name is Shiranyui Genma and. I'm the proctor for the Chunin exams finals. And it seems that two of the competitors are not here yet. They might even get disqualified. The first match will be between Yuzumaki Naruto of Kanahakur and Kuritsuchi of Awagakur. The rest of you mosey on up to the competitors stand up there. If Yuzumaki-san is not here in five minutes he will be disqualified. He announced. Where the hell is that guy? The Iwa Kanoichi gritted her teeth since she hasn't even seen the QB Jinchuriki since coming back from her village. It seems that two of your shinobis are missing, Hokage Dono. Tsuchikage grinned at his rival. You must be slacking off in your duties. At least you have one in the finals to represent your strength, Inoki Dono. Hiruzen grinned at his Earth Shadow counterpart. But don't worry, I'm sure you have much more fate in her. He got you there, Pops. Rashi chuckled seeing the short-aged shinobi grit his teeth. The arena stayed quiet for the time being. Many hoping that the demon didn't gain more power that it already has, while others were hoping that he does make it on time. Only to get accidentally killed by their village rival enemy Kinoichi. Kuritsuchi stood there with a frown on her face. 
The granddaughter of the Tsuchikage was thinking on ways to end the red-tinted blonde's manhood in so many ways that even the author had to feel bad for the story's main character. Genma sighed as he mentally did the countdown. Looks like his time's up. He shrugged. He was about to declare Kuritsuchi the winner until a glowing seal appeared a few meters away from the Tsuchikage's granddaughter. The two ninjas tense sensing very power presences from the glowing arcana before them. Without warning glowing green chains bursts form the seal coiling and wrapping among each other as they began to form a tower about three stories high. The crowd watches the top of the head form the head of a serpent. That's not the signal of the attack. The disguised man thought with a mental frown. The head begins to open slowly showing a woman about her mid-twenties. Her eyes were closed and she has green short hair that reaches just past her slightly pointed ears and a small black fedora on her head. She had a small friendly smile she folded her arms over her cup bust. She wears a grey coat that was open, showing that she wears a yellow bottomed up shirt with a black loose tie around her neck, along with a pair of office grey pants, held up by two belts and a pair of black sole shoes. Now that I have your attention. Her smooth voice travelled across the stadium despite of how soft and sinister it sounded. Good day, you tuckerds and smart people. I wish to say thank you for such a glorious event made for my hubby. Now I know some of you are wondering who is this bis. Where the tuck did she come from? Oh don't go covering the kid's ears, they'll learn these words eventually. She sighed with a chuckle. My name is Hazama. And that is all you will know. Now introducing my man. Yuzumaki Naruto. The second arcana appeared beside the one from Hazama, and another torrent of green chains bursts out of it, but this one was formed the head of a snarling fox. The maw opened showing green steam flowing from it and small green snakes crawling around in the bottom jaw. The inside though very dark until it was cut through by a deep blood seven-foot nadachi with black handle and diamond patterns, the tsuba shaped like an eight-head beast with the neck and heads coiled around it down the center. The crowd gasps as a figure stepped out of the darkness and made his way to the edge of the maw. While doing so the green fox head bleeds red and snakes melt to black liquid. The figure was quite imposing. Wearing a full black suit with red pectoral and eight-pack abs casing along with shoulder pads and red elbow-length gloves. Red flat sole shoes that reached to his shin and a blank faced helmet shaped like a humanoid fox. Stepping at the edge with the tip of his shoes. Sheathing his sword on his back like his white clad teacher, he leaped out and landed on ground with a silent thud. Are you Yuzumaki Naruto? Genma asked wondering why no one tried to attack him or the Hazama woman that just landed next to the red clad man with a that wide grin still on her face. The split in half opening up and showing the grinning, Namikaze, Yuzumaki Naruto. That's my name. He stated as the both the green serpent and the red fox bursts into a thin stream of smoke of their respected colors. About time, Yuzumaki. Kuritsuchi growled as she clenched her fists. Missed you too. The QB container chuckled. Genma sighed seeing that the young Kinoichi was ready to tear the Yuzumaki a new hole. Are the combatants ready? He questioned the two getting a nod from the pink-eyed Kinoichi and a nod from the QB offspring as his face helmet clipped shot. Begin. He shouted as he leaped back along with his ama. Before the Iwa Kinoichi could have blinked Naruto was right before her, sword swinging down to cut her in half. The crowd was shocked that he showed such strength with a simple swing, while others cursed the face that the demon might have become too strong already. Luckily she moved just as the blade was near her and avoided being cleaved from head to toe in half. She was even gladder once the blade slashed into the ground a deep trench was carved into the ground down a good few hundreds of meters deep. That earned a holy. From the competitor's box. NGOJ. He has to be using his demonic powers to win this battle. A woman whispered to her fellow civilian friend. Yeah. She replied in a soft tone, hoping that none of the Anbus could hear her. To think that the Hokage would allow Thatbus to protect us. The moment that thing gets its power back we'll be all doomed. Unknown to the Manbus were listening to their conversation, but chose not to do anything since they kept to words on a down low. They also didn't realize a redeed Kumo Kinoichi that was sitting behind them by a few benches, narrowed her topaz eyes. He's no monster. She thought. Because if he was she shuddered at the thought as she rubbed a small black necklace that was giving to around her neck. NGOJ. But you dodged. Otherwise this match would have been over before it started. His voice sounded void and mechanical. That was pretty good. Kuritsuchi grinned as she raised her left sleeve past her shoulder showing a symbol of a bear. To be strong enough to do this you've gotten more powerful if you can cause such damage with a simple swing. She commented as she placed her right hand on the tattoo and pumped some chakra into it. What makes you think that I didn't use any chakra? The masked demon container quizzed. During my three months training my grandpa and uncles though me the basic of being a sensor. And since I didn't sense any chakra. A puff of smoke bursts around as she drew her weapon from her seal. That means I can use this. She cried out as she swung her weapon cutting through the smoke and blowing it away. 
The crowd gasps as the others cheered loudly at the view of the weapon. The granddaughter of the Tsuchikage wields a battle axe. The grey-coloured ten-feet pole with a crack-like decoration seems to be made from materials that would be very difficult to find. The deep orange axe was at the top about eight and a half feet from the butt of the staff leaving. The base of the axe was a feet wide and widens to an incredible five feet at width and three feet away from the pole. NGOJ. Back on the competitor stance before Naruto made his attack. Troublesome blonde making his intro. Shikamaru sighed as he leaned against the railing from the balcony. That was pretty cool though. Fu grinned as she watched the young man leap down and stood before Kuritsuchi. Narukun so amazing. Kin praised with her hands clasped over her chest. I expected that he would do something less eye-catching holy. Kankiru began, but shouted seeing the Jinchuriki's power after the initial swing. Well damn. Hinata praised her fiancé's strength. I'll say. Tamari agreed. He's strong. Gara nodded as she crossed her arms over her stomach. Someone worthy of proving my existence. She grins as she shuddered in anticipation. After I'm done with that Ichiha I will enjoy the upcoming battle with him. What say you, Shukaku-san? She questioned the sand demon as sealed within her as she watched Kuritsuchi summon her weapon. Breaking every bone in his body would suffice. She answered with a maddening chuckle. You're gonna kill him, aren't you? Yujito asked. Over the three months she decides train here in Kanoha, since there was an area with abnormal electromagnetic waves near the forest of death. The two containers happened to meet there and hit off at a good start. And by good, I mean they fought to see who will permanently train there. Sadly or fortunately, Jashin proposed that they share the field. Even with the two working together they will lose to the goddess even in friendly spar. He thought that being an Achiha he can take me as his mate. She snarled. He is unworthy to be the father of any child. They meant to that. The two-tailed demon cat chorused from within her hostess's seal. NGOJ. The two combatants stood still, both with their weapons ready for the other. The Tsuchikage's granddaughter narrowed her pink eyes as she rushed towards the masked shinobi. Within striking distance she swung down her axe, seeing if he can take the force of her strength and weight of the weapon. Naruto did not disappoint her by raising his nadachi to block the large axe. The clash was so immense the spectators thought that the two opposing blades would break in such a strong titan-like contact. The ground beneath their feet was simply crushed by their combined force, creating a crater two feet deep and ten feet in diameter. Hirachi grinned widened as she struggled against the Kanohanin, both holding against the other with one hand. This is it. He's the one. She declared in her mind as she quickly turned to get the man off balanced and swung vertically hard to the his midsection. Only to meet the blood red blade to block it from going any further than it should. Leaping back the orange streaked blackhead hoisted her weapon over her shoulder and tossed a heavy polarm at her opponent. Leaping over the tossed weapon, Kachina's son made a quick movement to go and incapacitate the pink eyes Kinoichi. Swing for her neck he missed as she ducked under the blade and flew into his guard. Moving back to avoid and uppercut he was sure he felt the wind pleasure despite the masked helmet he wore and sent a knee to retaliate. Only for to collide with her own knee in a shockwave-like clash causing the crowd to cheer more as some began making wagers to see who would win, the most voting against the QB container. Leaping over the blade that aimed for her leg, Kuritsuchi jumped and managed to kick him in his chest, sending him back due to force of the blow, with the Kinoichi leaping behind him. Seeing that he was being kicked at the lodged weapon in the wall, Naruto attempted to try and using as a pole to swing off it, but missed since it poof away in a plume of smoke. Crashing into the wall with his back first, the red-clad shinobi looked up and see his Iwa assailant with her axe in hand, ready to deliver the finishing blow. The attack struck and the area was covered in dust as debris flew from the impact. The crowd cheered once again at the display of power. The majority hoping that the killed the main character of this story. Anne. PFT. Fat chance. The other half hoping that he survived which is a handful compared to the complete population of the village. You missed. Naruto declared as his helmet receded back and folded around his neck. His hair splayed out and reaching to middle of his back in a loose spiked blonde hair with red and black streaks. His now dark violet blue eyes looking into the pink set of Kuritsuchi's. The dust and many were awed and disappointed that the QB container was still alive. Kuritsuchi grinned as the dust revealed that the blade was mere inches away from the shinobi's face, his left finger at the side of the blade, indicating that he moved it. That's because you moved the blade before you were killed. She countered. As if dying was that simple. Naruto thought as he flicked the blade to the side. Nice material. He complimented the weapon's user. But we should finish this. As soon as he finished that sentence Kuritsuchi felt herself being pushed back by a palm and was sent back a good few meters. Thankfully she kept a good grip on her weapon and swung it like a bat, just as she saw the Jinchuriki rush right at her. Naruto seeing the large axe cutting through the air to get to him, simply raised his hand and caught it with a resounding clang. A large wave of dust was blown away from the contact. 
Naruto watched his opponent's eyes widen as he raised his blade. I win. He stated as he slashed her down from her left shoulder down to her right hip, causing a lot of blood to spurt from the wound. Atsuchi Kage looked shocked at his granddaughter was still standing after getting slashed and losing a decent amount of blood. Shesh lost the old man muttered in near disbelief, his sons keeping a stoic expression on their faces, but inside they were as shocked as their father. Oh my. May giggled at the scene. It seems that match has been set. Her revealed eye glancing to the Hokage. I did not know you had an Uzumaki in your village, Hokage Dono. He was given the name by a dear friend that died the day of the QP attack. He simply answered. What do you think I don't know? Ha 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 ha. This is good. Very good. I chuckled. I like these kids, Enoki. The buffed Kage complimented. Both show great strength and patience at a certain point. He commented. They are able to hold themselves against each other for quit some clashes. Kazikage added with a short nod. Even though they showed nothing but power in this fight, I have a feeling that both were holding back a great deal. May said as she leaned onto her left hand. That guy's hot. The redeed behind the queen commented. Juliet. The blue-haired young woman scolded. They both show promise in being a chunin. Han stated. But they both need to learn that strength is not everything. I can assure you that when they get their jackets that they'll prove their position. Both fire and earth shadow stated at the same time. It seems that your granddaughter is about to do something. The young queen reported calmly as Erika was the scene. Guritsuchi allowed her weapon to poof back to her seal as she took a few staggering steps back. She slapped the Jinchuriki's hand away as he tried to help her. You're the one. She giggles as she pulled out a kunai and rose to cut a small lock of her hair and tied it with a small white band. No Noki thought. Looking at the small lock of hair Guritsuchi smiled as she went to kneel on the ground. No, no hand sighed mentally. Raising the lock of tied hair she presented it to the groom of Jashin. No, no, no Rashi sweat thinking of what his younger brother, Han's older brother, would do when he finds out about this. You are the one. She said with a pleasant smile. I Kuris Tsuchi Jenin of Awagakur, daughter of Katsuchi Jonin of Awagakur, granddaughter of Anoki Tsuchikage of Awagakur, present this, a lock of my hair to you. Someone that shows great strength and courage. I offer this to you as a token of union between you and I. May our villages gain peace through the joining of our family and by extension, our villages. Duck. Katsuchi's gonna blow a gasket. The three Iwa representatives shouted in their mind, but kept a calm farce. Naruto who read up, more like his mother forced him, on tradition from the other villages and countries replied. I, Yuzumaki Naruto, Genin of Kanahagakur accept your offer. He stated as he placed his hand on her occupied one. Let our countries flourish through our union from now until the end of our lives and beyond. He grinned showing that his canines were slightly longer as he raid her up to her feet. Kuritsuchi matched his grin with her own, showing her dentures as well, despite the wound she was stalling with her chakra. Looking at the Kage box directly at the leader of her birthplace, she gave him a peace sign. Tell my dad to suck it. I found a real man to be with. She giggled as she witnessed the person that sired her father to the world face palmed in the midst of his fellow Kage and the one queen. Turning to the proctor she gave a tired laugh. Protori forfeit. And with that last note she promptly fell into the Jinchuriki's arms. Genma nodded and added to fact that the QB host ones again helped their village flourished. Winner of this match, Yuzumaki Naruto. He announced loudly with chakra enhancing his voice for all to hear. The crowd remained silent in shock, awe, and to a few asshole villager, anger at the Kanoha residential Jinchuriki. He of course did not care as he carried his now sleeping opponent to the four Mednins that were waiting for him to put his latest fiancé on the small stretcher, so to carry her to tend to her wounds. Noticing how one of the med looked at the sleeping Iwa Kinoichi with disdain, and he scowled as he gripped his shoulder. If anything happens to her not only will you be dealing with me, but you'll also be dealing the whole of Iwa Shinobi corpse. You heard what happened with you guy idiot that tried to rape the Kumo Kinoichi before I had left to take three month training. He rhetorically asked getting a quick nod from the nin. I'll make it much more worse if you or anyone else that you are associated with. He finished with his eyes being completely voided in the depths of obsidian and a dark smile on his face, am I understood, medic? Hi. He yelped as he and the others carried Kuritsuchi. Not knowing that a small speck of shadow was following them. You can never be too sure of the people around you. Nodding to himself, Naruto sheathed his Nadachi and made his way to the second floor to meet the other competitors. NGOJ. Upon arrival he was tackled by two of his fiancés in a hug, but he managed to keep himself and the two from falling down the stairs. You were amazing, Naruto-kun. Hinata praised. Damn straight he was. Fu grinned. So how does feel to get all this attention? Naruto looked at the various looks from the other Chunin hopeful. Seeing that he got all their attention he chuckled as he rubbed the back of his head. Hey guys. How's it going? 
troublesome black and red streaked blonde. The genius sighed as he pulled out a small cigarette from his freest pocket and was about to lit it until a small gust of wind blew out the fire and the cancer stick from his hand. Damn. He muttered not even bothering to look that his friend was the one that did that. Uzumaki-san. Yujito called the QB host as she stepped up to him. Gently releasing his hold on the Kinoichi that was holding on to him he stepped forward. Yes, Nai-san. Wow that sounded weird. He thought. I would to thank you for saving my teammate from a fate worse than death. She said bowing her head in gratitude. That's nothing, Nai-san. Naruto smiled. Any sane person would do the right thing. Um from what exactly did Naruto-kun saved your teammate from? Hinata asked since she noticed that before the three-month training, one of her clansmen were severely beaten within an inch of his life. And is still in the hospital up to this moment. He saved my teammate, Karui, from being raped by a Hyuga member. Yujito hissed. The girls gasped as the guys had look of disgust on their faces. I know some good acupuncture technique to put a man to be sterile until the day he dies. Haku stated with a dark grin hidden behind her mask. Mind if I help? Kin offered. Gladly. The masked Kinoichi accepted. Olnara Shikamaru of Kanagakur and Sabaku no Tamari of Sunagakur stepped down to the arena. Genma's voice interrupted them. Tamari grinned as she sent a wink the QB container and leaped off the balcony as she opened her fan to glide down while sitting on it. This is quite a conundrum. The Nara air thought out loud as he narrowed his eyes in concentration. This is a situation where life and death meets on the battlefield. He sighed closing his eyes, deep in thought. Snapping his ocular organs open as if he had an epiphany, he placed his left fist on his right palm. What's wrong, Shikamaru? Naruto asked his friend and fellow Kanoha ninja. Naruto. The Nara air began as his head slowly turned to the Jinchuriki with most serious face he's even seen. Gulping he continued. I might have to forfeit before the match before it starts. Bet you're fast down there and fight like a man. The not so completely blonde shouted as he punted his friend off the railing to the ground below. Am it Naruto. The Nara air shouted as she crashed into the ground. Second time I got pushed off the balcony. He grunted as he pushed himself off the ground. Second damn time. He grumbled rubbing his sore head. Sighing as he looked at the fan-wielding Kinoichi, who was sitting on her fan like goddess on her personal cloud, his eyebrow twitched. Gotta fight a woman again. Kami why me? Genma looked at the two and nodded. Are the two combatants ready? His response was Shikamaru sighing and taking out a sig to light it as Tamari flipped of her fan, opened it, and held it by her back. Begin. He shouted as he leaped back from the two. Tamari grinned as her sea-green eyes gained a slight hint of bloodlust behind them. With a mighty swing she let her fan blow a gust of wind that kicked up sand and some rocks, aimed at the Nara air. Cursing with groan and forcing his body to move, Shikamaru leaped out of the way of the gust and took out two kunais from his pouch and tossed them at the Kazikage's eldest child, while tossing a third one a few meters away from his intended target. Tamari seeing the two kunai block them, whirled around and sent another gust of wind the Nara air after spotting him landing a few dozen meters away from her. Stop moving and take the hit like a good boy. She grinned widely as her demonic blood was pumping adrenaline through her veins during the fight. Troublesome woman. I wanted to give up, but your boyfriend up there literally kicked me down. He retorted as he throw some chakra-enhanced shurikens. Folding the fan to knock the shurikens off course, Tamari closed the distance between herself and the Nara air and swung her weapon towards the temporary enemy. He's not my boyfriend. She yelled as she slammed the blunt weapon down breaking the ground upon impact and kicking up more dust around herself. Well not yet at least. She added. You're right. Shikamaru's voice agreed as he held a kunai to her neck as his left hand was posed in a half-tiger seal. If you wanna live that is. The dust cleared showing Tamari holding her fan as her throat was very close to the sharp throwing ninja knife. Well. This is a bad position. She quipped. Damn straight it is. The Nara air sighed, his cigarette knocked from his mouth during the small scuffle. Give up or I blow us both to kingdom come. He threatened in a drawl tone. And what can you do that'll put both of us in danger? She challenged as she attempted to move. What? But couldn't. What did you do? She snarled. On a side note, Kagi main no jutsu, shadow imitation jutsu, complete. He added. In case you were wondering I actually trained to the point that I can move my shadow with chakra to a certain extent. I also placed enough explosive tags on your fan, and the kunai a few feet away from you has a trap seal of kunai in it. So either way, you lose. He finished with a chuckle. So don't make this hard on yourself or else Kazaka Gay sama will have a daughter that can't talk. He added with a dark tone as he pressed the blade closer to Tamari's neck. Don't think that you're the only one that trained during the three months. Tamari countered as wind began to pick up around them. A warning though. I have almost no control over this. 
The last thing Sikamaru expected was for his opponent to give up, but did not foresee that he was pushed by a sudden heavy gust of wind that simply blew him away from the Kazikage's eldest child. The crowd watch in shock as Tamari glares at the tumbling form of Nara Shikamaru, and the wind picked up speed to think that a tornado was imminent. The wind began to solidify to the point that they can see that it was wind gathering to a form of sorts. The upper body of a torso and the arms to match the build of a bodybuilder. A head formed with horns that bend upwards with glowing emerald green narrow eyes. Claws formed with five drills like nails, along with green gems that in palms that match the eyes. The Mari's eyes changed too. No longer were they sea green, but now a dusty yellow slit with four circled around it within black square. Fuitin. Kaze no Kaijin, wind release. Wind giant, she declared as she holds her fan pose to swing as the living wind golem opened its mouth to gather wind. Before the wind manipulating Hanyu can even preform her attack, Shikamaru raised both his hands in the air, as far as his joints would allow. Tuck it. Proctor, I forfeit. He stated with a straight bored face. No way can I face that in the wielder. I would probably die from that jutsu even if she held back. Genma landed and nodded as Tamari growled while the giant bursts. Winner of this match, Sabaku no Tamari. Your daughter is a very powerful Kinoichi, Kazikage Dono. Here is in compliment at the Veiled Face Village leader. I thank you, Hokage Dono. The Kazikage nodded in gratitude. Tamari has trained diligently during her youth and the three months recess. He praised his daughter's work. Her wind manipulation far exceeds that of a genin. May stated. She was born with an abnormally high affinity of wind. The Sabaku siblings replied. Such strength like that is mostly inherited. The young queen cut in smoothly as she brushed her finger over the rings. Mostly due to the same gender or the genetic codes that the child carries. May nodded agreeing to the words of the young queen. I have two keke genkai, both I gained from my parents. She glanced at the kazikage. I can only assume that she gained her high affinity of wind from her mother, since it's obvious that you don't have that type. The kazikage sighed as he nodded. That is true. Either way. I interjected they're both damn good in what they do. The Nara was good in making traps and predicting certain actions the enemy would be able to do within reason. As Tamari san was good to use her trump card at the last resort to ensure victory. Inoki nodded. The Nara boy seems to lack motivation. Mitsuki added. He's even lazier than Erika. Nina grinned. Hey. The blue-clad young woman pouted at the insult. Don't deny it. It only hurts more. Julia chuckled as she placed her left hand on her hip. Congratulation on your win, Tamari. Gara congratulated her eldest sibling with a nod, while Kankiru gave her older sister a thumbs up accompanied with a proud grin. Good work, sis. He smiled. Thanks, Gara, Kankiru. Tamari smiled. Congrats, Megami no Kaze, Wind Goddess. Naruto smiled as he approached the Sabaku trio. Tamari went to thank him, but paused as she noticed the small lock of hair at the front left of his bang. Is that a lock of hair? She questioned knowing the answer, but asking just to make sure. The QB host chuckled as he played with lock of hair Kuritsuchi offered him. A little bit of chakra, mad science and yaki, you can have this styling new hairstyle like yours truly. He tried to sound one of those TV guys that tried selling their outrageous shampoo product. Damari giggled. Well I'll see what I can get from you. She smiled as stepped closer to him. Maybe more. Oh? He raised an eyebrow and ignored the small giggles from his two other fiancés, standing at the side talking. Oh indeed. She grinned, but a small well of sand popped up between them, as Makoto draped her left arm over the Kanoha Jinchuuki, while holding her clothed claymore with her right. Aryo. Tamari looked to her youngest sibling who happened to pull off a stoic innocent look, while Naruto simply greeted the shorter Tsum Kanoichi with a two-finger salute. You have gained my interest, groom of Jashin. Makoto said with a small calm smile. You have also gained my friend's own as well. Makoto. Mai's face was red in embarrassment as she stormed her way towards the two. Omanagi Makoto of Tsumegakur and Naiyujito of Kumagakur, please come down for your match. Genma shouted. Makoto quickly gave the Jinchuriki a small peck on the cheek before leaping over Mai, who stretched her arms up but missed and made her way below. Yujito simply walked by the QB host and bumped her hips against his. Wish me luck, Foxy. Naruto blinked at this as Mai huffed in annoyance. How the hell do you get so lucky? Kankiru asked. For the record. I blame my mom. He thought but gave a shrug in response. You forget that I want a lot of grandkids, Sachi. Kishina giggled. You and those strange fantasies of yours. A second female voice snorted. Oh, hush you. The QP simply huffed. I'm sure you'll make some very cute grandkids for me to spoil. The Jinchuriki groaned as he massaged a bridge of his nose, knowing that his second tenant was blushing up a storm. You okay? Gara asked. You some Oh don't worry. He smiled. 
besides the fact of having not one but two powerful beings sealed in your gut that can literally level the entire shinobi nation. On their own. Yujido walked into the opening of the field and locked eyes with golden yellow set of Itsum Kinoichi before her. It seems that you are ready for this match. Mikoto calmly stated as she held her clothed sword in her left hand and bowed to her opponent. I'm more than ready. Yujito replied as she pulled out her chikudo and allowed the tip to drift over the floor. Let's see with cat can scratch harder. I assure you. Mikoto's eyes narrowed as she removed the cloth and tossed it aside. I can starch deeper than I can during these three months. She admitted as the cloth crashed in the distance kicking up dust and rocks. Once the cloud dissipated the cloth shone to be in a five feet deep crater. Ignoring the usual shinobi shenanigans, Genma simply raised his hand. Are the two combatants ready? He shouted seeing Mikoto set into her stance as Yujito allowed some ration chakra to course through her blade. Begin. He shouted as he leaped back. Mikoto took the chance and made the first move. She ran to her fellow Kinoichi, dragging the weapon along the way over the dirt-covered ground, making a six-inch trench along the way. Yujito stood ready as her opponent neared her and ducked under the swing of the heavy obsidian sword that literally created a gust of wind over where it cut. Caught off guard by the move she was kicked by the foot of the yellow-eyed Kinoichi and was nearly cleaved in half from the vertical cut-down attack. Sliding back, Yujito managed to stop herself from going any further and leaped as she swung down her ration-infused blade. Rai Kinjutsu. Kaminari Naikami no Ken, Lightning Sword Release. Sword of the Lightning God. She shouted as a lightning-shaped blade descended upon the Tsum Kinoichi. Makoto sucked her teeth as she leaped back to avoid the lightning strike form Kumo Kinoichi and slammed the tip of the blade into the ground as Yujito landed and rushed towards her. Seeing her temporary enemy reaching close, she channeled chakra to her sword and pressed the blade deeper into the ground. An. I don't play lol, but a lot of my friends do. Yujito instincts kicked in and also her tenant warned for her hostess to move in fast. She leaped aside just as a large hiltless black blade from the sky that was aimed at her the force of the strike was enough to shake the foundation and kick a large amount of dust. Aniyabi Jinchuriki mentally cursed as she covered her eyes from the hard-blowing dust. Kitten, duck. Matatabi warned her container sensing the claymore wielder behind her. The blonde young woman ducked as the black blade swung over her head. That was close. Thanks Matatabi. She mentally sighed as she trucked back with her left foot at an attempted horse kick to the younger girl's gut. She was very satisfied that her foot connected. Let's try this this. She mentally scowled as she went through a few hand signs and inhaled deeply. Bakoto dug the blade in the ground using it as an anchor to slow herself down. Damn she kicks hard. She grunted as she stood. She was about to rush again until she sensed a spike of chakra in the dust cloud. Pain. Mizumi Kadama, fire release. Mouse hairball. Yujito shouted as she spew several blue mouse shaped fire projectiles at the golden eyed Kinoichi. Having no time to avoid the attack, Mikoto decided to use her blade as a shield to block the blue mouse fireballs. The attack exploded on impact as she was being pushed by the force of the shock. I got you now. Yujito grinned as she used a Rai Sunshin, lightning body flicker, to appear behind her with her nails extended and aimed to the back of her neck to knock her out. We got each other. Mikoto countered as she pierced the ground with her sword once again this time making go in almost completely. The effect was immediate. In an instant thousands of black spikes that branched once they reached a certain length, erupted from the ground and completely surround the two Kinoichis in a way that if either of them he moved the wrong way, they would be dead. It even became more dangerous when the spiked ends morphed into lion heads with their maws aimed at both Kinoichi vitals. Akaim Sakinakin 2. Rain no Den, Obsidian Sword Art. Lion's Den, Mikoto grinned as she felt Yujito's nails tickling the back of her neck. Damn. Yujito felt a drop of sweat go down her neck as she felt one of the lion heads growled near her face. You have two choices. Mikoto demanded as her eyes locked with the demoness container. Give up or we both die. Or. Yujito smirked as she allowed her body temperature to rise exponentially. We both can burn before we end up in hell. She offered. Mikoto growled as Yujito hissed in response. Both Kinoichi's eyes turned to slit as their dentures lengthened to that of a feline's. The two glared at each other until they both huffed. We'll finish this another time. Mikoto snarled baring her teeth. Oh we will. Yujito agreed her eyes giving off a faint glow. Proctor we both forfeit. The two announce as the temperature died down and the lion head sink back into the ground along with the rest of the den. Genma nodded. Both combatants forfeit this round, neither of the two are the winners. He announced as the two walked off the field. I'm getting too old for this shit. He sighed as he scratched his head. It's strange for Mikoto sent to give up. Nina wondered. Perhaps she found a rival of sorts in that Kumo Kinoichi. Mitsuki stated. Looks like she found a rival. The queen giggled. Well Mashiro should get a rival too. Erika cheered. 
Erica the young queen warned. Hi. To think that Yugi would have loss. She could have showed that sword swinging girl who da boss. Oh yeah. He nodded his head as if he solved the world best equation. Be san will you please stop? The gray-haired young Kumo Kinoichi asked with a sigh. No can do kiddo or these good rhymes will go out the window. He responded as he jotted down his notes while he continues to hum. Bujito did good, but she held back way too much. Aside. So did Makoto. Mashiro agreed. We will have to learn more next June in exam then. She questioned her bodyguard. Like my San Makoto is a high man like us Odom ranked. She can still be promoted, but she will have to use those advanced moved. Erika stated in a rare serious tone. If I may ask why did she not use those advanced moves? Here is an ask the queen. I'm sorry, Hokage don't know. But those are our village secret. Mashiro apologized gaining an understanding nod from the older man. Well I say that your Kanoichi did good in this match. Inoki commented. She seems to be Chunin material already. He stated as he looked at the dark-skinned village leader. She should at least be Jonin rank consider the amount of chakra has hidden away and the talent she would be able to show. A simply sighed but remained silent. Fine be silent you little runt. The old short man grumbled at the Raikage show of disrespect. The Kazikage simply chuckled at this. DGOF. The two Kanoichi walked upstairs. You both did well. Naruto complimented the two. The Kodo was about to respond until her orange-haired teammate held her in a headlock. Karma's abyss, isn't she? She grunted as she rubbed her knuckles over the smaller girl's head. Wait until we get back home. I'm sure Kagetsuchi sama will have a good chat with Moroku sama She threatened. You wouldn't dare. Makoto challenged as she struggled to get out of her friend's grip. Try me. She challenged with a chuckle as she let up on her assault. Fine. The sword-wielding priestess grumbled as she pouted and folded her arms over her now-clothed sword. But you still like him. She muttered low enough. Naruto simply chuckled at the two friends' antics. Will you ga Hinata of Kanahagakur and Fu of Takigakur come down for your match? The Jonin announced as he stood in the middle of the clearing of the ruined battlefield. Fu grinned as she watched her fellow fiancé leaned off the wall. You ready to get your fast kicked fair maiden? The Nanabi Jinchuriki taunted. The older Hugh Gyarus only walked towards the black and red streaked blonde with a sway on her hips, which caught all the male occupants in the vicinity attention, and draped her arms around his neck and gave him a deep tongue kiss. Pulling away with his lower between her teeth, she released it as she gave the tanned orange-eyed demon container a smile that would make an arch succubus green with envy. Now who said that I was a virgin? She giggled as she made her way down the stairs. Who simply stood there gobsmacked and slack-jawed. Her head whipping from the retreading Hugo to her fellow demon container. Wabu. Dot when how. She stuttered as her finger shook, pointing at Kashina's son. Taking a deep breath she marched towards the young man, grabbed him by his shoulders, and smashed her lips against her own. Moaning as she felt his arms wrapped around her waist, she deepened the kiss before pulling back. Licking some of the saliva she gathered from him she grinned. When this is over you're making a woman. She winked as she ran and leaped off the balcony. Seriously, how the hell do you have so many women? Kankiru yelled in envy, but withered as he felt the Kai emitting form the Kanoichi that developed feelings for the QP host. Sorry. He whimpered. Anada watched as Fu crashed onto the ground kneeling and stood straight. Took you long enough. The Hugairi smiled. Yeah, yeah. Fu mumbled as she cracked her knuckles while rolling her neck. Up in the stance he ashi watched as her eldest daughter was about to fight her match. She wears a pale brown kimono with a yin-yang symbol on the back that has two hawk wings at the sides that showed her figure and e-cup bust despite her age and giving birth to twins in her younger years. Her hair is brown with a navy blue lock of hair framing the left side of her face. Like many Hyuka her eyes are pale violet. Beside her was Hanabi who was dressed in a formal kimono mentally cheering for her sister as well as Niji who sitting beside the younger heiress. This will be interesting match. He ashi commented as she looked to her younger daughter and niece. Watch carefully you two. Hi, Akasama Hiyashi sama the two nodded as they looked. Are you two ready? Genma asked too. His reply was Hinata slipping into her Jayuikan stance and Fu shifting into a Tejutsu stance. Nodding to himself he raised his hand. Begin. He shouted before he leaped back. Fu pumped a sufficient amount of Yaki into legs and leaped with a takeoff at the Hugairis. Glad that she got the pale-eyed girl off guard, she swung her left leg aiming for her sides and was nearly successful in striking her. Anada managed to regain her bearing and leaned back from the foot that clipped her right shoulder. Quickly she retaliated by swinging her right leg up towards Mintet's exposed back and managed to jab her finger into her left shoulder blade. Flinching upon the contact, Hinata leaped back as she shook her hand to dull the pain. Boo grinned as she watched her fellow fiancé shook her hand. Aw, oh, what's wrong? Does the princess need me to kiss her finger? Did you break a nail? 
She teased she turned fully towards her current opponent. A minor setback. Hinata stated as she activated her Dejutsu. Let us continue shall we? Gu felt her skin crawl, and not in a bad way. Oh. Let's. She replied as she shot some black tendrils from her hands aimed at the Hugo Iris. Hinata seemed that she has no choice, but she avoided them as she closed the distance between herself and the Taki residential Jinchuriki. She was glad that was very flexible and bend in such a manner people would have mistaken that her body had no bones at all. Grinning internally as she broke through her mint-haired opponent's defense, she lashed out with a chakra-infused kick to the Jinchuriki's stomach. She was satisfied when she was rewarded with Fu forcefully exhaling air from her lung, due to direction her foot struck. That satisfaction turned to pain when she felt the orange-eyed Kinoichi slammed her fist into her chest. Both added a good amount of chakra to the strikes was violently pushed away by the other's force. Nah, coughed, bad. Fu panted as she patted her stomach. For a girl with soft hands. She grinned. You, pants, want to talk, cough, Fu San Hinata replied as she placed her hand over her bruised chest. She hits a lot harder than I thought. She beepized as she looked at her opponent who took a deep breath and stood tall. Tucking Jinchurikis and their stamina. She cursed as she frowned. Aw, oh, what's the matter? Fu teased as she took some daunting steps. Wish you had more stamina. Sadly I use most of the stamina when in the bed. She replied as she finally regained her breathing. Touché. Fu deadpanned as she allowed her skin to darken to a dark gray bordering black color. But I'm the one that's going to be in the finals. She declared as she rushed toward the Hugo Iris. We'll see. Hinata whispered as she ducked under her left jab, quickly turning, she thrusted both of her palms into the Mentet's stomach, as expelled a great amount of chakra. Jayakim. Tensu and Shing Tenahira, gentle fist art. Heavenly twin vacuum palms. She cried as she sent the Nanabi container away from her with a blast and a shockwave emitted from the impact of the blow. Gu dragged her feet over the ground making two small trenches. Standing as she patted her smoking stomach she simply raised an eyebrow. You have definitely been training. She complimented as she kneeled and slams her palms on the ground. You'll need more time. Kuroi Toj no Mori, Blackthorn Forest. Anada enhanced eyes widened as she felt some chakra sources heading towards her from below the ground. Shit. She mentally shouted as she avoided a black spear that erupted from just where she stood. Sidestepping a second thicker spear, she decided to make her way to the still kneeling container. Unfortunately she had to leap back just as an even thicker spear bursts in front of her. Anada looked as more spears pop out of the ground, and they bent to her direction. Guroi Hari no aim, black needle rain. Fu cried out as she sent her tendrils towards the palite heiress. Jayakinshm. Hakusho Katen, gentle fist art. Heavenly rotation. Hiashi's oldest daughter shouted as she spun around like a top, while expelling chakra from every pore of her body, creating a dome of condensed chakra, and blocking the spike from hitting her. Fu gritted her teeth in annoyance, and was careful not to put too much chakra into the move, lest she wanted to kill her fellow genin rank Kinoichi. Anabi watched wide-eyed as his sister take on the Taki Kinoichi, using one of her clan's strongest techniques. Nisama is strong. Indeed she is. Hiashi agreed with a proud smile on her face. But what of you, Hanabi? Do you wish to continue your training? The younger heiress nodded. Yes, I do Akasama. Now more than ever. Then both Niji and Hinata will help you in that. And you can add your affinity to your move set as well. And don't worry about the elders, I'll deal with them. This is impossible. A male elder of the Hyuga household whispered. How can that wench be so strong? I do not know. A female elder replied with her eyes narrowed at the display. If this continues we will lose face. We've lost face since that demon has bed with those two, and he ashi did nothing but formed a marriage contract with him. A fourth elder growled lowly. If we can somehow get the younger to turn against the older. The first elder muttered. Who raised her hand, bringing the black tendril from the Hyuga and back into her body. Oh you are much more enjoyable to fight than that excuse of a shinobi I fraught against in the preliminaries. She commented. Anada stood panting in a small circular crater. I'm not like him. Good. Fu smiled. The last I need is to kill another weakling. But I think we should bring this fight to an end. With that she rushed towards the still standing Hyuga with high jonin speed, and was instantly before the Hyuga heiress with her left fist beat back ready to knock her out. Anada took a deep slow breathing breath as she ducked under the strike and was instantly within Fu's guard. You are within my field of divination. She preached as the field turned black and an eighth trigram circle appeared around the two Kanoichi with Anada at the center of it. Lowering her stance, her left hand stretched low ahead of her and her right hand stretched back as he announced her technique. Jayakinshm. Haki Rakujkin SHM, Gentle Fist Arts. A trigram 64 palms. Haki Nai SHM, A trigrams 2 palms. 
She yelled turning and slams two fingers into the tan-skinned Kanoichi upper chest and lower abdomen, pushing her back by a few meager steps. Stepping in Hinata continues her attack. Yawn SHM, four palms. Striking the lower chest just below full left free stand upper right arm. Hachi SHM, eight plams. The targets were her upper right abdomen, left thigh, right wrists and left shoulder, causing the tan target to turn by the force of the blow, exposing her back. Jikroku SHM, 16 palms. She continued to wail on her paralyzed opponent's lower back, left shoulder blade, middle of her back, nape of the neck, right shoulder, left thigh, right ankle, and right shin. Sanjuni SHM, 32 palms. Striking various points the author would not bother to mention, Hinata truck low to point that fool was lift off the ground. Haki Rakujkin SHM, 8 trigram 64 palms. She ended by sending hard and rapid paced strikes to Jenin, with the 64th strike aimed at her stomach, slamming her down, as she added an additional hit. Jayakinshm. Shmte. Gentle fist art. Palm heel strike. She slammed her palm on her opponent's stomach to add extra force against her back when she crashed into the arena ground, resulting in a small tremor and a huge dust explosion. I won. She panted. Think again. Fu gritted as the dust cloud blew away from the wind. Hinata had her palm pressed against the Taki Kanoichi's stomach, but a right blackened hand was in the way. I won. She grinned as she slammed her left hand that was blackened by the Jungu, Earth Grudge Fear technique. Black Forest Fist, Titan Crusher, Kuroi Mori no Ken, Tatankurus. She cried as she slammed her right fist into the Hugairus's gut, causing the set of pale eyes to bulge out slightly and her back to bend in by the force. Said force was enough to send Hinata rocketing towards the wall smashes into it. Hinata hung there lodged into the stone wall within a sizable crater. Her body was bruised and she felt a few of her ribs cracked by the collision of Fu's fist and the wall to her back. Hinata weakly raised her head, showing that her left eyes was close to prevent blood that came from the cut of her head from going in. Looks like Kea lost. She conceded as her head simply slumps forward. Fu was instantly by her set and gently pulled her out. You did good, princess. She complimented her unconscious fellow fiancé. Proctor, call the match. The demon container said as she picked up the heiress like a bride and proceeded to carry her to the infirmary. Winner of this match, Fu of Takigakur. He cried out getting cheers of approvals. Well damn I need some hot sauce. B grinned as the power of the Hugo heiress. She knows how to bring down the house. She's a strong Kanoichi for someone so young. A commented. Yeah. Derui drawled as he scratched the back of his head. The Hugas are really dangerous once they get their hands on you. He commented. That is the pride of the Hugo clan. Harrison stated with a small chuckle. The Taki Kanoichi also put up quite a fight. He added earning nods from his fellow overseers. Agreed. The Kazikage nodded. She used quite some techniques with those tendrils inside her body. The technique of Takigakur. Inoki muttered. It's called the Jongu, Earth Grudge Fear. A technique that replaces your blood and with millions upon millions of black threads. The person becomes a living hive of sentient threads. And how do you know of this technique, Tsuchikage Dono? May asked with quirked eyebrow. It may not look it, but the Jongu, Earth Grudge Fear was originally created by a friend of the show Dai Mate Tsuchikage. He confessed. But due to the strain it does against the user, and the majority would be killed while the rest are crippled for the remainder of the lives, we sealed the technique away. Unfortunately a missing nin from our village stole the technique and was able to get away from us. Now we see that where it ended up. If I recalled, a Kanoichi by the name of Kakuzu was ordered to assassinate the Shadam Hokage, Senju Hashirama. Hiruzen stated. She also wielded those black threads. He nodded to himself. I would say that both have met great requirements to attain their Chunin status. Mashiro stated. Even if the Hyuga lost she showed great will and determination. The others nodded in agreement seeing no arguments with those statements. She lost. One of the elders growled. So what if she did? Another snorted. It shows how weak she became by letting herself be taken by that demon. We will bring this is up to Hiyashi. She must choose a suitable heiress. Naruto watched proudly as the two Kanoichis made their way to the medical bay. He then looked at the Kage boot. Looks like almost everyone from the other villagers are here. He mentally commented as he looked back at the partially destroyed arena. The guys are gonna have a field day fixing this up. He mentally cackled. Balabu Rami Shino of Kanahagakur and Sabaku no Kankiru of Sunagakur come down for their match. Genma shouted. Kankiru stepped forward to the railing of the balcony. Proctor, I forfeit my match. I know when I have to face an enemy that has an advantage over me before the battle even starts. He'll just use his bugs to get to me. He finished as he looked at the barely recognizable teen a few feet away from him. Ignoring the boos and jeers from the citizens he continued. Sorry about that. But I know when I'm beat. Shino simply nodded in acceptance. It is understandable. Why? 
because I would have done the same if our roles were reversed. Ara grinned. I hope to receive some good treatment, Yuzumaki. She hoped as she locked eyes with her fellow Jinchuriki. You'll have to kick the teams fast before you get to me. He challenged. That fool will not be able to get through my defense. The redeed stated as she walked close to the taller male, their face close enough that their noses were touching. I'll make sure of it. She whispered before vanishing in a swirl of sands. Bulji Genma's announcement was cut as the Ichibi Jinchuriki appeared on the field, with her arms crossed and her eyes slightly narrowed. I'm here. She said. Now call that fool of an Ichiha so I can get my battle with a much more worthy opponent. Genma nodded. Will Ichiha Sasuke of Kanahagakur present himself to the field? If he is not here in five minutes he will be disqualified. Genma announced as he bit into his senbon. It seems that the Ichiha might not make it. A commented as he leaned more into his chair. Probably scratching some itch, playing around with abyss. We. Oh. That was tight. He grins writing down his rhymes once again. Oh no ink. He then dabbed his pen over his tongue for a few seconds and continued to write. I will burn that book if you proceed to sing those awful rhymes, B-san. The green-eyed Kinoichi threatened the older Kumo Shinobi. He paused. You wouldn't. He challenged. I have been successful in the past. I will be in the future. She warned. The two stared at each other for what seems to be an eternity. Perhaps we should give the Achiha a few more minutes. The Kazikage suggested. And why make such a suggestion, Kazikage Dono? That question came from Inoki. Well many important figures came to Kanoha to see the Achiha in action. He explained. It would be very disappointing if they came all the way here for nothing. But their own damn fault. The Raikage crossed his arms over his chest with a scowl etched onto his face. No need for normal people to come and see us fight for their amusements. May interjected. After all, we are killers. The brats are right. Inoki nodded. When in battle and we call for reinforcements, we expect them to be at the battlefield in time. Showing favoritism to one shinobi will be an offset to the rest of the shinobi corpse. Mashiro added. Therefore, he should be disqualified once his time is up. You can't be serious. The Kazikage asked. We are. Hirazin replied. Unless you have an alternative reason to press on why Sasuke should be giving more time. Seeing that man was not going to answer the Hokage of Kanahagakur stood from his seat and walked to the front of the podium. Due to the time limit reached, Ichiha Sasuke has been disqualified and therefore lost his right to be Chunin rank until the next exam. Therefore Sabaku no Gara of Sunagakur has won by default of Ichiha Sasuke not being present, he claimed with his chakra-enhanced voice. We want to see Ichiha Sama fight. A civilian yelled from the crowd followed by several others shouting against the overseer's announcement. The crowd was immediately silenced by the combined Kai emitting from the Tsuchi Homizu Rai Kage and Mashiro, that it silenced any and all protests, and those of weak wills passed out. Now that we have made ourselves clear. The Hokage stated firmly as his eyes looked at each and every, remaining conscious, people in the stance. We will proceed with next match. He said with finality as his eyes scoped onto Genma. The Jonin rank shinobi nodded at his leader and was about to open his mouth until a small gust of wind gathered in one location. Looking at the phenomenal he kept his guard. Leaves began to gather as two figures were shown in the windy leaves. The small tornado dispersed showing Kakashi reading her book, hiding a scowl on her face, and Ichiha Sasuke with smug arrogant look in his. Forgive our tardiness, but my student decided to come late when I surprisingly suggested not doing that. Kakashi reported as she snapped her book shot and glared at the Ichiha. Apparently he assumed he'll be allowed to fight even if he reaches late. Of course. The Ichiha stated with grin. I am an Achiha after all. There's no way I can be interrupted by such piffles. He chuckled as he raised his hands in greeting earning erupted cheers from the crowd. So where's the dope? I bet he lost horribly. He remarked. Bet he's probably dead and or lost his legs and arms. Fixing his hair he continued. I bet. That you would have lost even if you tried. Naruto interject as he shunshined next to his sensei. Hey, Kakashi sensei. He greeted with a grin. Yo. The daughter of the white fang greeted with her one eye smile looking good Naruto. If I was younger and have both my original eyes along with not having my face covered all the time, I would have gladly take you out to dinner. She joked. With a suit like that it gives my quite the image. She mentally giggled perversely. How about next week? The Jinchuriki proposed. What? She was caught off by that. Naruto smiled. Next week. Kashina's container repeated. Would you like to go on a date with me? Bakashi was speechless. She never thought that she was considered a dating option due to wearing her face mask from a young age. Three dot she was most definitely lost for words. And she was sure she felt her mouth was agape even with her face mask on. Genma chuckled at this seeing his fellow Jonin silenced by her student. If you two don't mind I have a match to judge. 
Right. Kakashi was knocked of her stupor. Genma nodded and was about to call out the next competitors, but the Ichiha cut him off. Well I'm already here. Bring the fool that would be dumb enough still face an elite like myself. The Jonin simply ignored the duckhead styled teen and continued without missing a beat. Gara San you may return to the competitor's box. Will Tsuchi Kin of Atagakur and Mamachi Haku of Karigakur come down? He shouted as he ignores the Sharingan wielder's Kai. Gara snarled softly as she walked towards her destination. Don't ignore me you fool. He shouted. Shut it, Ichiha Genma growled out and was mentally glad that the youth flinch, even it was very short. If you have a problem with this. Take it to Sande Emi-sama. Sasuke growled, Sharingan flaring with red furry. You are making a grave mistake, peasant. He gritted his teeth. Let me fight both of them then. He challenged as he noted the two Kanoichi coming down the stairs. I'll show them what a real shinobi can do. Like purposely reaching late. He quipped. No dice. Genma drawled. Now get lost. The Ichiha was about to continue but was cut off when a rain of golden feathers began to come from the sky. What the hell is this? He asked getting a bit drowsy. Ninpo. Nihin Shinjan no Jutsu, Ninja Art. Temple of Nirvana Jutsu, a voice echoed out through the vicinity of the stadium. Many people began to doze off as the shinobi and kinoichi that were able to detect the technique dispelled it. Moments later the sum of the civilians that were asleep removed their grabs, showing that they were ninjas from Odo, Suna, and Taki. Some of the shinobi lost their lives due to the shock, but the others began to retaliate against the invaders, ready to defend their home and birthplace. The Kage booth suddenly bursts into smoke, and Hiruzen was instantly grabbed and dragged to the higher ceiling by the Kazikage, who held a kunai to his neck, the older shinobi's guards killed by the younger one's own. The other Kages along with their bodyguards and the queen with her own surrounding them, each of the four leaders were wondering how to help the aged but powerful hostage. What is the meaning of this, Rasa? The old Siratobi gritted saying the Kazikage's name. Oh I think you know what I mean. Rasa stated, but his voice sounded different. A bit raspy and like a snake's. Wouldn't you say so, sensei? The Kazikage chuckled as he removed his cloth along with his face showing a pale at tall man with extremely translucent looking pale skin and straight waist length black hair, with the front strands falling to his shoulders. He had a long face with pronounced cheekbones, golden eyes with slits in his pupils, purple markings around his eyes and fang-like teeth. I believe this reunion was long overdue. He chuckled with a hiss. The two bodyguards leaping to Mashiro and Inoki, believing that the youngest and the oldest leader can do nothing. Shizu Narashi. Mashiro along with Inoki, yelled out to one of their bodyguards. Hi right. The two shouted as they leaped at the two bodyguards. Shizune summoning a gold two-sided Najinata as Rashi's left arm was covered in lava. Golden serpents calling, Kage no Hibi no Yabadashi left arm of the lava giant, Imgen Kaijin no Hidariud. The two cried as the purple-clad woman slashed at rapid succession at one of the bodyguards, as the bearded man slams his lava-covered arm through the other. The two bodyguards suddenly burst into smoke as four figures leaped from it and stood at the far corners of the roof. Well that was expected. I am Tama no Kidmaru, Kidamaru of the East Gate. The young man about 22 said as he clapped, all, his hands together. The young man is a dark-skinned shinobi with black shaggy hair tied in short ponytail and black eyes. Uniquely, he also has six arms and wore a black sleeveless top and shorts, over which he wore a tunic that bore the symbol with musical note within a pale white yin yang symbol, and a purple rope belt around his waist. He also wears his hit I8 over his forehead, along with arm warmers, shinobi sandals as footwear and bandages around his legs. Let's get along shall we he grinned. This is a waste of time. A young man about 18 sneered in annoyance of having to deal, in his opinion, weaklings. He has straight dark grey hair with long bangs that covered his right eye and a good portion of his forehead. He wears a green shade of lipstick and has dark markings around his eyes, giving himself an androgynous appearance. He wears brown tunics with long black wristbands, which could be mistaken for being part of his sleeves, black skin tight shorts, and purple ropes tied around his waist. He also wears a dark red beaded necklace around his neck and a giant scroll behind his back. Hanging of the nape of his neck seems to be a second head with the same hairstyle save that it was mirrored. Greeting weaklings. I am Saman no Saken. Saken of the West Gate. He laughed as he clapped his hands together. Shut the tuck up with your rattling, you tunt denying Mothardiker. A female about 17 shouted. The most distinctive feature is her long, untamed, dark pink hair and oval-shaped brown eyes with round pupils. She also wore a black hat with bandaged sides that looks like they have three ridges going over the crown. She wore a tan tunic, much like the other members, with black shorts and standard black shinobi sandals. Strapped to her left thigh seems to a flute. Getting tired of your shitty tucking attitude. She continued as she clapped her hands together. Go get some beep. 
Ah uh, Yuya, you should not speak with such a tone and unneeded use of words. It's unbecoming of a woman of your age. A deep toned voice lectured belonging to a man about his mid-twenties. Huck you, fat fass. She snarled bearing her small yet sharp indentures to him. I'm Hakuman no Tayuya, Tayuyu of the South. So don't tuck with me, you tucking tub of lard. The large and imposing young man sighed. He has orange eyes and three tufts of orange hair on his head. A mohawk of sorts that ran down the middle and two similar styled tufts of hair at the side. He wears a sleeveless tunic with the symbol of the sound four on the hem, along with black arm warmers, a pair of black three-fourths length pants that stop just below his knees. Along with this, he wore sandals with leg warmers, covered by bandages, a purple rope belt around his waist, and a necklace that comprised of circular pieces separating long, metallic pieces. Clapping his large hands he closed his eyes and takes a deep breath he introduces himself. Nam and no germ, germ of the south gate. You must perish today for the sake of Orochimaru sama. They then after set a chain of hand seals. Together we are the Atagakur no Shinobi Yan in SHK, sound 4. They introduce themselves as they slam their hands onto the tiles. Ninpo. Shishi Engine, Ninja Art. 4 Violet Flame Formation. They cried out as a transparent violet barrier stretched high into the sky and closed off at the top between the four shinobis and the village. A second one appeared before them to ensure that they were not his by any crossfires. Birazin felt the pale-skinned man grip slackened momentarily and leaped out of his grip. He pulled his robe off showing that he was wearing his battle suit. It's a light-weighted combat attire, consisting of a black jumpsuit, mesh segments over the lower portions of his limbs, and a green gauntlet that covered much of his right arm. He also wore an armored hood with a bandana-like forehead protector over this, tied with two long straps. Across the back is written Sande Ami Hokage, 3rd Hokage. We will finish what we left off, Orochimaru. He grimaced. Yes. The yellow-eyed man chuckled. We shall. The Mari we have to move now. Kankyuri yelled to his older sibling as he blocked a few kunai thrown at them. I know that. She yelled as she sent a mighty gust of wind that blew the Kanohanins away. I still can't believe we went ahead with this. She muttered. It had to be done. Gara stated as she caught a few unlucky shinobis in her sand and crushed them. Our village is getting poor while the daimyo send our missions to this village. I really don't want to do this, but we have little to no choice. The trio was interrupted by the sound of birds chirping. What was that? Kankuro questioned after commanding his puppet to send a spray of senbans to some of the Kanoha inhabitants. Sounds like a bunch of birds. Tamari answered. Gara's eyes widened as she instantly raised her sand before herself and her older siblings, just as a lightning inkist hand pierced through it in her shoulder. Tidori, a thousand birds. Saz K grinned hitting his target. Gara. The older Hanyus cried out. Head back. She yelled as she tried to pull the offending limp. Closing her eyes as she screamed she felt more electricity surge through her body via the wound on her left shoulder. Saz K was struggling against the weak Kinoichi grasps from the other side of the sand wall. Leaping back he did not expect a large sand-clawed hand with blue markings to follow after him and trying to crush him. Rushing through hand seals the last Ichiha inhaled a great sum of air. Katen. Kiryu Enden, fire release. Fire dragon flame bullet. He cried out as he spat a large dragon-shaped fire blast at the arm. The flame was enough to slow down the arm. That's what you get for messing with the elites. He grinned. A very tall man appeared by the Kazika gaze children via sun ascension, sand body flicker. He has two distinctive red markings on the right side of his face, the only visible part of his head, with the rest being covered by his turban-like headgear and by a sheet hanging from it on the left side of his face. He dons the standard attire of a Suninin, complete with a forehead protector and flak jacket. Aki-sensei. Tamari said with concern as she looked at her younger sister. Gara meanwhile was holding her head trying to suppress Yukaku's anger for hurting her hostess. Forgive me, Tamari-sama, Gara-sama. He somberly apologized as he went though some one-handed seals. What are you her sentence was cut off as she senses her brain was being controlled as she along with Gara began to scream, both shutting their eyes closed as they grit their teeth in pain. What are you doing? Kakura yelled as he was about to stop whatever his sensei was doing, but was knocked out by the man. This is for the good of our village. He muttered. Naruto just recently slashed another unfortunate Odonin in half that thought he could have gotten the drop on him. Beside him Sakura smashed the face of a Suninin that insulted her of her small chest size into the ground. Kin was on the other side throwing senbans and using the melody arms to either knock out, kill, or break the insides of the enemy nins. There are a lot of enemies, Naruto-kun. Kin reported as she just slashed Asuna Kanoichi's throat was a kunai and kicked Taki Shinobi in the balls before stabbing him in the jugular with her senban. And seems the Taki decided to join the losing side. Perhaps after this you can use their hidden village as your own personal base. That could be a good idea. 
Sakura leaped into the air with her left leg up. And they keep coming back like cockroaches. She yelled as her heels smashed into the ground and uplifting large rocks and debris. Baron was with them piercing a lot of the enemies with golden chakra chains that were coming from her back. This is amazing Hazama cheered as she cut through some enemy nins with a pair of butterfly knives. Her lips curled into a wide sadistic smile. This is annoying. He frowned as his shadow stretched out as a shadow revor rose from it. This one was different shape though, like most shadow revors, this one is also female figure. The difference being the height of 5 feet 9, reaching just by Naruto's chin and purple hair tied into a low back ponytail with black ends and a bow. She also wears a mask, but eyes were a mixture of red and brown. She has D-cup shaped bust with a white symbol of Jahan, just above her cleavage over her chest and descent wide hips. Her feet looked like shoes, and her fingers were black love appearance with red 10 inch nails that looked like they can claw through anything. Anything. The Revor bowed. Naruto Sama, Ragna, and some of the others wish to participate in this battle. They have already taken care of the forces outside the walls, but have missed the summoning circle. We'll deal with that in a while. Naruto simply replied. Bring them forward. As you wish. She nodded still kneeling as she placed her hands onto the ground the shadow growing larger, and five females came rising from the depths of the darkness. The first one is a young adult woman about her early twenties white spiky hair and heterochromia eyes. Her left eye being green and the right being red. She wears a vibrant red sleeved jacket with two long thin tails hanging from the back. Under it is a black thin strap top that strains against her DD bust with three red belts around her waist. She wears a black glove with a red shell on the backs of the left hand. Her right arm is prosthetic seeing that it was black with ruin marking on it and has red sharp claw-like nails. She wears a black shin-length hakama that hang from her hips low enough to show the thin straps of her red underwear, presumably a thong, and steel two dread boots. She also has a black birthmark on the center of her chest, the form of a black dragon's head roaring. Strapped to her lower hips is large-looking intimidating sword. The staff being a good five feet in length with blade taking four feet of with a space between the blade and the staff. The blade itself seems to give off a feeling of dread and look like it's not showing its true form. Hey there, babe. She gave a two-finger salute as she pulled out her weapon and slams it into the ground. I'm ready for some more fun. Nisama, please keep your blood in check. A calm cool female gentle voice admonishes the white tea. The young is a beautiful looking and slender young woman about 19 with short stylish blonde hair, two bangs framing her face, and a short braided ponytail that reaches down her small but round bum and bright green eyes. She wears a black thin turtleneck over her B-cup bust and leggings under a white Japanese-style tunic, white gloves, military boots, and a jolting sapphire-colored jacket with a red lining and very long, detached sleeves. Held in her left hand is a sword with a length of six feet from the tip of the ice blue scabbard to the white pummel of the handle. The hilt seems to screwed shot by two menacing-looking fanged blue bolts. Ah, relax, Jin-chan. The two-colored eyed woman sighed. Look at Noel. She seems fine. That's not true Ragna one chan said young woman protested as she looked around the battlefield. Even Balvark feels on edge. Noelle is a young woman about 19 with long back-length blonde hair, if she wasn't covering it her blue balmoral cap, making it seem like she has short hair and green eyes. She wears a jolting sapphire uniform dress with a white collar and a short red tie, with two separate long sleeves that have two heavy metal bands and a long red strap, white gloves, and carries two giant pistols linked together, the Balvark. Oh don't be a stick in the mud, no chan. A chirpy voice laughed. The owner of the voice has stylish brown hair with two bangs that has pale white ends framing her face. She has two cow licks, one front that is longer than the one bent back, on her head and large brown eyes. She wears an orange fighter top showing the bottom half of her DD cup bosom and has a cross-shaped spear round tip strapped to each wrist that reaches just past her elbow, black strap panties with an orange skirt-like cloth, long black stocking, and orange boots. From below her skirt is a large squirrel tail that is brown with a pale white center line. Hubby. She cheered as she hugged Jinchuriki and cooed as she felt his hand petted her head. Hey there, Makoto-chan. He greeted with a gentle smile. So this is Konoha, ha, huh? another female stated with a bored tone. Looks like a tucking battlefield. She complimented with a small grin. This is a young woman with white hair that spikes out like a wave over to the right side of her head that leads to a bang down to her chin. She golden colored eyes, dark skin, large e cup bust, and a scar across her nose. She wears a black jacket with a white button up, with the top four buttons missing, showing an impressing amount of cleavage, and showing her slim midriff and torn up short shorts that shows off her legs and thighs, along with knee high black and white heeled boots. A single large buckled belt that crosses her waist and the rest leads to the length of at least four feet in length. On her arms, she has set of gauntlet like weapons. 
the right gauntlet reaching just before her elbow with a large spike buckle on the elbow, and the left one being larger, and looks like a cone with a large round end at her wrist, and thins down as it passed her elbow. Sakura-chan, Karen-chan, and Kin-chan. The Kanoha shinobi called the three Kanoichis. These are Ragna the Blood Edge, Kisaragi Jin, Noel Vermilion, Nanaya Makoto, Bullet and Ami-chan. The three Kanoichi nodded at them in greeting, but Sakura's eyes widened at the last introduced Shadow Revor that was revealed as Ami. Ami-chan. She gasps. That's right, forehead. The now known Ami replied, her voice no longer distorted. She smiled showing rows of saw-like teeth. Beauty thought that Yaoyu. The pinkette tried to talk as tears gathers in her eyes. The Revor hugged her. You thought I was dead form that fire, huh? Feeling the pinkette nod then holding her at arm's length, she gave a sad smile. Well I was. Until Naruto-sama saved me. She sighed as she fraught of the memory. We'll talk later though. But right now we have our village to protect. Sakura wiped her eyes and gave a firm nod. Right. Okay. Naruto took command of the small group he's with. Hazama go have some fun. See if you and Ragna can get enough info on the enemy. Alright you got it. Din-chan, Noel-chan and Makoto-chan. You assist the shinobis to guide the civilians and kill of the weaklings along the way. As you wish, Naruto-sama. The twins bowed. Hi, hi. The beast kin cheered. Bullet-chan, Ami-chan. You go out and. He was cut midway by a large crashing sound by the front gates of the village. Looking at the source of the chaos he sees a boss-sized summon three-headed pale snake thrashing and defeating the shinobis. Deal with that. He finished. You got it. The pale-haired young woman grinned as she clenched her right hand the mechanics in the gauntlet turning. As you wish, Naruto-sama. Ami smiled. The QP host nodded. Sakura-chan, Kin-chan, and Karen-chan. You're with me. What are we going to do Naruto? Sakura asked in full business mode. Naruto was about to answer until he felt a massive pulse of Yaki at the arena. Sachi. That's you Kakus. She's being controlled. Kashina yelled from her seal. We'll handle that. He pointed at the arena just as a fully released Shukaku and an equal-sized version of Tamari's case no Kaijin, Wind Giant. Shukaku is a sandy brown colored tanuki with dark blue markings all over its face, body, and tail. It has a jagged concave mouth with and the sclera of its eyes are black with yellower eyes and pupils that each takes the shape of a black four-pointed star with four gold dots around it. The sand giant looks obese and has strong-looking forearms and short stubby-looking legs. Are you tucking serious? Kin asked as she watched the two elemental manipulating monsters stand there. But of course. He grinned. Niji and Hanabi were facing a group of Odo, Suna, and Taki Shinobis. Well look what we got here guys. A bunch hot chicks ready to take care of our needs. One Odo jeered as he eyed the two Kanoichi with nothing but lust and most of the blood not in the head above his shoulders. Oh look, Hanabi-sama. A bunch men that think that they have beeps. Niji stated stoically, her Bayaku gone active. Hey you blind bis. I'll have you know that I made a lot of women scream. One of the shinobi shouted in anger. In terror, I bet. Hanabi giggled. Bet he's big enough a baby would be disappointed. The shinobi were pissed that they were insulted where it hurts. Get those bisses. One of them shouted. Hanabi ducked under an Odo shinobi swing and jabbed his left thigh going up she struck his side then his chest. At the last target she added some chakra and bursts the poor fool's heart. Niji meanwhile was jabbing fool's left right. Catching an Odo nin in the throat, a Suna nin in the gut, then slamming her knee to the person's nose and also smashing two Taki nins in their elbows when they tried to cut her with a synchronized attack. Hanabi-sama. Right. The two gathered chakra into their palms and began to turn. Jayakinshm. Haki Kekishm, gentle fist art. A trigram vacuum wall palm. The two cried as they faced the opposite direction and sent a wall of pressured air via their outstretched palms at the enemies before them, killing and knocking out a few of them. They then saw a few of the coming from the air, and they began to spin like a top, while expelling chakra from their bodies. Jayakinshm. Hakusho Katen, gentle fist art. Heavenly rotation. The two shout as two massive domes of chakra blew and shred them away. The two Hyuga stood in their stance. No one messed with the Hyuga. They chorused with a determined looks in their eyes. Barira no Ken, gorilla fist. Guy shouted as his gray shaded fist smashed into a masked Suna Shinobi's stomach, turning his insides into mush. Azarakiku, gazelle kick. Lee shouted after leaping from an attacking Taki Nin, shooting a high-powered straight kick to his head, snapping his head back and breaking his neck. ZM no Sutanpu, elephant stomp. They sink their movements and stomp the ground hard using both their chakra and the weights they carried. The result was the ground shattering beneath their feet and the offending enemies being blown away from the force. As one the teacher and student combo leaped at their attacking group before them. Let's go Lee. Guy yelled. 
Hi, Guy Sensei. The young copy responded. Hiji no Kuchibashi, pheasant beak. They shouted as they held their hands up like they were holding sock puppets and proceeded to peck the enemies in their way like two green blurs. They too ended on the other side of the enemy platoon and stood there in their posed last strike. I am Mike Guy. And I am Rock Lee. The two raised their fists allowing their manly tears to trail down their cheeks. And we will protect our village with our bodies until out last breaths. Damn straight you will. Two surviving, one Odo and one Suna, Nins grinned as they raised their kunai to get rid of the spandex duo. Only be stopped by a kunai in each neck from the distance. I swear you guys do a lot more screaming than fighting. Tenton commented as she landed on the ground with her long-sleeved shirt slipping past her hands. She has an annoyed look on her face as if she was rudely woken up. Gritting her teeth as she heard an enemy shouting behind her, she swung her left-sleeved arm and her trusty 5-meter diameter spiked flail emerged from it. Don't shout when you sneak up on a ninja. She lectured before slamming the stupid nin with a flail and crashing three houses behind each other. Stupid dumbass. She mumbled as she pulled the large rounded spiked object back into the sleeve, ignoring the blood and gore. Let's go Akamaru. Kiba shouted as his ninkan barked in agreement. The two leaped and began to turn rapidly as they tear through the ranks of the enemies. Gitsuga, fang over fangs. He shouted as continues to rip through the enemy nins. Don't have all the fun for yourself, Ataudo. A female yelled with a feral grin. She has long brown hair which she wears in a ponytail with two locks of hair framing her face over her large black eyes. She also wears a light shade of lipstick and has the traditional fang-like tattoos of the Inuzuka clan on both of her cheeks, in addition to a tattoo on her upper right arm that resembles a flower. She wears a form-fitting variation of the Kanoha flak jacket which doesn't have any chest pockets and she keeps the front of her jacket unzipped, exposing her cup cleavage. She also wears a pair of form-fitting shorts cut just above the knee, bandages just below her tattoo and wrist warmers. She seems to have a softer appearance than the other members of her family, not having extended canines or slit-like eyes and wild, untamed hair. Running besides her were three dogs having the same gray fur with white undersides and short pointed ears and mostly resemble huskies. Let's go, Himeru Sankimdai. She shouted as she and the three began to rotate like buzzsaws. Gatenga, Fang rotating Fang. The woman watches as her pups defeat the intruders in her home village. She has an animalistic look similar to that of her son Kiba. She has long, spiky, untamed brown hair, vertical slit-like pupils, elongated canine teeth and nails. She also has the clan fang markings on her cheeks, as well as markings over her eyes and a dark shade of purple lipstick. She wears the standard outfit of a Kanoha shinobi consisting of flak jacket and a black suit underneath, with the sleeves rolled up that holds back her e-cup bust and bandages around her legs. She allowed a feral grin to form on her beautiful face as she looked to her partner. Wanna show these pups how a veteran fights, Kurumaru. Kurumaru, an adult canine with a wolfish appearance that's at least a size bigger than Akamaru. As his name suggests, he has black fur, but with a white underside. He is missing his left ear and wears an eye patch over his right eye. I don't see the problem about that, Sum san. He replied with a growl. Good. She grinned as she saw a group of Taki nins about attack a small group of civilians. The two leaped off their perched as was zigzagging through the ranks with solid slashes and bites. Reaching the last one the Inuzuka cried out her technique. Sumjin Rumga, clawing swift wolf fang. Grinding against the ground on all fours she looked at her children that were staring at her with shock and awe. And that's how you deal with the enemy. Ah. What are you doing Katura? Asuna Shinobi yelled before he was repeatedly stabbed by Asuna Kanoichi, her eyes being glazed over. Around her were several other dead shinobis that invaded Kanonoha. Majin. Ribingu Akuma, living nightmare. A female teen that possesses long brown hair and light brown eyes whispered. Her hair is straight on one side, but on the other side it is in a braid. In addition, she sports a clip with two circular designs. For her outfit she wore a pink kimono held closed by a pink sash with two pockets on the front. She also wore violet baggy pants and red mesh armor underneath her kimono and legs, along with sandals that were orange in color and a brown hit I ate tight around her neck. Oh don't worry. She said with dark smile as her brown eyes slowly darkened to black obsidian. She'll join you soon. Won't you? Asuna Kanoichi began to giggle madly as she raised her bloodied kunai to her neck, a maddening glint in her eyes as she descends into the madness placed on her. Slitting her throat she laughs until she choked on her own blood and fell to the ground. No one messes with my playground. She mentally snarled she walked away to deal with more of her hostess's enemies. No one. Ujido hissed as she found herself cornered by about seven shinobis. You shouldn't corner me. She said ominously. Or what? One of them sneered. Ujido didn't answer. 
Instead she lowered herself until her hands planted on the ground, her nails extended to at least 10 inches, and gave off a blue burning glow. Her eyes turned heterochromia. The left turning blue as her right turned yellow, both with slit pupils. Growling as her teeth sharpened to that of a feline's, she tensed her leg muscles and leaped at the seven. Hutting through one of the unfortunate shinobus that was dumb enough to clash against her, the body burned instantly in blue flames. Been a while since I've used these, Hamada Tabi. Right you are kitten. The demon sealed inside of her responded. Now let us some temporary scratching posts. She shouted in glee as her hostess leaped at the remaining six. Ducking under a slash that was aimed at her back, the Niibi Jinchurik slashed clean through his knees, joints and all, and he fell to the ground and bleed out. This is getting boring. She frowned as she went through a set of hand seals. Katen. Sunkatsui, fire release. Blue fire crash. She yelled before blowing a stream of burning blue flames, burning the remaining nins to a burnt corpse party. Nodding to a job well then she leaped up to ceiling to assist the other inhabitants. Harry grunted as she pushed the now dead Odo Kanoichi off her, after she impaled her with one of her new swords. The blade is a long black katana and gives off a dark feeling of death itself. The handle is red and about 10 inches length with a paper talisman on it. Panting as she stood she looked at the blade and smiled. Itches in Hisatsu, Murasum, one cut killer. Murasum. Well she got stabbed, but that's still a type of cut. She said as she saw that a few more of the enemy backed away from the Kumo Genin. Hey, don't walk away. She shouted as she took a few steps back. Just a little cut. That's all. She then rushed at the small group and in was close to her and was about to stab her in the back, but was stopped by a senbin finding its pointed way in his neck. Ignoring the gasping enemy she proceeded to slash a Taki Kinoichi exposed arm and stabbed one of the shinobi's legs. Ducking just a spray of senbin passed over her head to render the others useless. Standing she looked at the person that assisted her. Thanks, but I had that. Isarabi simply grinned as she twirled a senbin in her hand. Really? She let the senbin fly as it passed Carrie's unflinching face and pierced a groaning nin in the head. It seemed like you missed one. Whatever. The dark-skinned Kanoichi rolled her eyes with smile as she sheathed her sword next to its twin. The Sanbi Jinchuriki eyed the blades. I've noticed that you did not use the other. This one. The topaz-eyed Kanoichi started as her hand hovered over the second blade. Is one I should use as a last resort. The Kiri Kanoichi nodded. Well then. She smiled as she pulled out a large needle-like sword. Shall we continue to defend this village? Huck yeah. She grinned before the two leaped at the battlefield. Samui was glad that the majority of her slain enemies were male. Well since the majority of them were stupidly killed by her unintentional swaying priests as she moved to block, parry, counter, and attack the enemy. This is not cool. She mentally stated as she kept her aloof expression while killing the enemies. My back is going to give me such a problem after this ordeal. Samui. Yujito shouted as she landed right behind the busty blonde and slashed an enemy Kinoichi across her chest and blew her mice-shaped fireballs at a small group. You okay? My shoulder hurts. She stated neutrally. Right. The Kumo residential Jinchuriki deadpanned as she slashed an Odon inside. Ignoring the blood spill on her clothes she looked at her busty teammate. Maybe you need a massage. She suggested. Maybe I do. Samui agreed as she glared at the few shinobi that were leering at her chest. I'm gonna blow of some steam now. It's cool if you help me. Gonna bring out those weird gauntlet things you I gave you from the goddess. Yep. Was the reply as electricity began to crackle around the Kinoichi's fingers up to her elbow. Rushing forwards with her fellow Kumo Kinoichi beside her, Samui punched the Odonin closes to her. Rumringu sand, rolling thunder. She muttered. The target felt nothing at first, but then a burst of electricity burst through his body and out his back. The man dropped dead with a smoking hole in his gut. Samui stood over the dead body, her eyes even colder than they were. She wore a set of silver gauntlets with gold coffin shaped out dent in the center, and a piece that extends up to her lower arm from below her elbows shaped like lightning bolts. On the wrists were a set of cylinder shaped metal. Clenching her fist she held up her hand as it sparks electricity. Rage and Funu. Adaramarak, Thunder God's Rage. Adramalich. She said coolly. Tajiro cut through another enemy nin with his nervous expression still on. Come on. Can't we just not fight? He shouted pleading as he held both handles together and to shock of the enemy used the blade like a pair of scissors. Cutting one in half he failed to see the other Taki Nin behind him. Luckily it was stopped as a mirrored ice wall appeared between them. Out of the ice the masked Haku leaped out and lopped the enemy's head off with Tanto. Ah. Thank you, Haku-san. The blue-haired teen bowed avoiding a blade swipe that was aimed for his head. Rising back quickly, he placed his bandage blade over his shoulder, coincidentally cutting the attacker down to his chest. Freaking out from the meaty thudder heard and turned just as Haku giggled at his antics. You're welcome, Chijiro-san. She nodded. 
Haku-san, please go out with me. He instantly yelled. Taking of her mask she replied. Of course. Yada. Back to where we left off. You? Finish where we left off. The S-rank Nukenin of Konoha chuckled. My dear sensei, you couldn't bring yourself to kill me back then. What makes you think that you'll do it now? He challenged. You're old and frail while I'm still young and healthy. You're also outnumbered. I yelled as ration chakra sparked around his body. For now that is. Orochimaru chuckled as he went through a quick series of hand signs and clapped his hands together. Kuchius. Nido Tensei, summoning. Impure world resurrection. He shouted in glee as six coffins burst from the tiled ceiling before him. Each having a kanji on them. Shodai Mei. Nidame. Founder. Maria. Ayakuran. Ishikawa. The figures stepped out of the coffin and the majority of the crowd gasps. The first man was a tall with tanned cracked skin and vacant dark eyes. He has waist-length black hair typically styled in a center-parted fringe that framed his face. He wears the standard shinobi dress of his era, consisting of dark red armor worn over a simple black suit with sandals. This armor was constructed from numerous metal plates, formed into multiple protective guards along his body, each collar of his shoulder guards bore the senju symbol. He wears a kanahagakur hit I-8 over his forehead. The second man has cracked fair skin with white shaggy hair and vacant dark red colored eyes. He had three red markings on his face, one under each of his eyes and one on his chin. He wears blue armor with a distinctive white fur collar over a simple black suit. This armor was constructed from numerous metal plates, formed into multiple protective guards along his body. Beneath his shoulder armor he wore two bands on each arm. This clothing was accompanied by sandals and a hapuri in place of the more traditional hit I-8 protector. Engraved on the hapuri is the symbol of Konoha. Ashurama sensei, Tabarama sensei. Hiruzen silently wept seeing his two deceased senseis. A third person was female. She wears a robe similar to the Odom rank women, but hers is pink and resembles more of a housemaid's clothing. She has vacant dark green eyes and pink hair set in a neck-length perm. On her head she wears a sort of feathered crown. Her skin also has several cracks on them. The fourth person was also female. She has gray hair showing her age and dark vacant green eyes. She wears a one-piece dark gray dress with a wide scarf-like belt around her waist. She wears a pair of brown shoes. You monster. Juliet growled upon seeing the two females. The fifth is a man of old age with copious amounts of long, gray hair, along with a long mustache and beard that merged into one, all of which almost covered the entirety of his face. He has a scar that ran across his left eye, which was apparently blind. His teeth are sharp and triangular, a trait that should only be seen in the Kiri no Shinobigatana Shichin and SHK, Seven Ninja Swordsmen of the Mist, from Kurigakur. Attire-wise, he wore a simple, light-colored, loose-fitting kimono over a pair of dark pants. His right eye is black, and his left eye is pure white. Jodai Mei Sama. Mei gasps at the founder of her village. The sixth man is also of old age. He has a bristling mustache and long beard, both of which had dark highlights running through them alternately. His eyes are also squinted, thus hiding their colors. He wears a dark, loose-fitting full-length gown that was tied using a lighter sash around his waist. Jodai Mei Tsuchikage Sama Inoki growled seeing his own father, angered because his eternal rest was disturbed. Meet the dearly departed. The snake-like man chuckled as he snapped his fingers. Slowly the light began to come to the eyes of the revived people. What? Hashirama groaned as he looked around. Is this Konoha? He questioned as he gazed through the purple barrier and currently war-torn village. What the hell is going on? It seems that we have been revived via my technique, Hashinai. Tabarama scowled. And our village seems to be under a joint invasion. The Shodai Mei Hokage gritted his teeth. Who dares? Hoya, Hoya. Hashirama, huh? The Shodai Mei Mizuki's voice blubbered. Seems like we're all victims here. And I don't like this. Not one bit. He frowned as his single eye gained an angry gleam. You're not the only one who dislikes the fact that your rest was disturbed. Ishikawa stated gruffly as one his eyes parted slightly showing dark pink pupils. Inoki. It's been a while. Hello father. Miss Maria. Natsuki whispered in shock as to seeing her revived instructor from when she was younger. Meister Kruger. The older woman gave a prim greeting. It seems we are in a time that we do not belong in, Fujino-sama. It would seem so, Meister Grassibert. The woman beside the revived old lady responded with small nod. And I can see that there are others that I do not know. She continued. Enough talking. Orochimaru hissed. Upon the command the six stood ramrod stiff and their mouths were shut. And now to invite your living friends to their eternal slumber party. He grinned as he created six Kage Bunshin. Giving each a seal tag he ordered them to place them within the heads of the fallen warriors. Once the seals were applied the cracks on their skin closed and the skin regained their natural living colors, and their sclera turned black. 
each taking a deep breath as if being alive for the first time. Not as strong as you were when you were alive, but it will suffice. He remarked. Now attack them. By Akurin versus Turumi Mei, Yudakata, and Yugura. Hoya, Hoya. The aged Kage chuckled slightly as he stood before them. Looks like I cannot control my body as I see fit. His eyes narrowed as his hands went through a quick sequence of hand seals. Suitan. Massababurusitor plus Mu, mass bubble stream. He exclaimed blowing a massive stream of dark colored bubbles. Both Mei and Yugura quickly went through some seals, as Yudakata blew a torrent of bubbles from his pipe that, much to the revived Mizukagi's surprise, cancelled out his own. Imten. Imkai no Jutsu lava release. Melting apparition Jutsu Suitan. Sandan no Jutsu, water release. Scattering bullets Jutsu. The two women shouted as they sent their respected attacks. The two attacks collided with the opposing bubble attack and spread it out while bathing the small area in a steam-like mist. Ninpo. Kurigakur no Jutsu, Ninja Art. Hidden in the mist Jutsu. The four Kiri Nin said as one in a dead calm tone. Hoya, Hoya. These youngsters aren't as bad as I thought. The Shodai Mei Mizukagi complimented. That boy. To be able to cancel my Jutsu. He must either be very strong or Jinchuriki. Bah, whatever. He said as he ducked under Yugura's swipe of her hook staff. You should conceal your presence more. He lectures the younger Kinoichi as he swung his hand, creating a water crescent wave blade as it neared her face. He was inwardly impressed that his one working eye saw that this was a water clone. Hoya, Hoya. Very good. Raising his left hand the steam formed into a well of dense water that blocked a hail of kunais that was aimed his left side. You have to do better than that. How about this? Imgen Chapu, Lava Chop Mai cried as she sends a lava chakra infused chop that cut through his water wall and slashed down his robe, burning it on contact. Iakurin quickly grabbed her wrist. While he did not feel pain since he's dead, he was still rather impressed at this young woman's prowl. Sangisham, Coral Palm. Yugura shouted as she struck the one-eyed man with a palm strike to his head. The Shodai Mei Mizukagi stumbled to the side form the strike and immediately felt the weight on his face. Ripping it off he saw the some strange heart and subten growing on his palm and stretching up his arm. Once again he felt the weight on his head and felt travel down his back and sides. Although he is dead the first Kiri leader was amazed by this ability. Hoya, Hoya. It seems like the young miss has the ability make corals upon contact and force grow them like spores. A very handy ability if you want to capture someone. He stated as he still ripped and tore of the growing corals off him, but whatever part they fall they still continue to grow onto him. Feeling his body moving slower he smiled. It seems like you've won. It was a short battle, but one well worth of my time. I leave Kurigakur to you, Mizukagi. His final words were sealed away as the coral completely covered his body. Mei nodded in gratitude at the trap show Dai Mei Mizukagi. Impton. Shakugakenken, lava release. Scorching armored fist. Her fist was inkist in lava, and she punched through the area where the head was, destroying the tag and the head of the sacrifice. Mei sighed as she took a deep breath. Yugura, assist Raikage Dono. Yudakata, assist Suchikage Dono. I'll help Hokage Dono. Hi, Mizukagi-sama. The two Kirinins nodded. Ishikawa versus Anoki, Han, and Rashi. So it's me against my son and grandsons, huh? The show Dai Mei Tsuchikage grunted opening one of his eyes. It's a damn shame that brat brought me back to life just to fight his own battle. I know the feeling. Inoki agreed. Well then. The show Dai Mei Tsuchikage started as he began to levitate off the tiles. Shall we? He challenged with both his squinted. Let's. The San Dai Mei Tsuchikage agreed as he also floated from the tiled ground while performing hand signs. Doton. Desecadic, Earth Release. Earth and stone bamboo shoots. He called out just before four sharp pointed spikes of earth burst through the tile ceiling and was heading towards the airborne Kage with decent speed. Han set himself to a horse dance as steam erupted from the furnace on his back. Feeling his muscles strained to the max he launched himself into the air using the steam as a rocket boost and landed on one of the spikes. Futon. Futon Jinkai HMN, boiling release. Boiling steam horn. He bellowed as the steam erupted from his furnace and formed a drilling needle of steam over the rock spike. Yoten. Imgen Rick, lava release. Lava flow. Rashi's cheeks bulged before spewing a stream of lava towards the airborne Ishikawa. The squinty eyed Kage level shinobi clapped his hands together. Doton. Desecric no Jutsu earth release. Earth and stone dragon. Then an earth dragon of massive proportion bursts out of the ground and rounded around the caster. Ishikawa swayed his hands in motion as the earth elemental dragon not only blocked the four pikes from hitting the floating man, but also intercepted Rashi's lava flow and withstood Han's attack. Han ducked under the earthen dragon and leaped towards his grandfather. 
swinging a steam-infused fist and was fortunate to land a punch to his target's left jaw. Feeling the space around began distort he saw that he was on the ground and his oldest brother in the place of where he was with a lava-infused fist slamming into Ishikawa's stomach. Boromal M. No Ken, Fist of the Primal King. The current Tsuchikage's eldest son shouted as his fist slammed into his country's first leader's stomach, burning through his clothes and body and sending him crashing down against the tiles. Sorry about that Han. Rashi apologized to the red-armored man as he landed besides him. As long as you got the hit on him it was no problem. Han replied. This isn't over yet. Inoki stated as he looked at his father that stood up, the wound and clothes healing as ash and dust gather around it. Not bad. Not bad at all. The revived shinobi commented as he dusted his robe. But this is far from over. He stated as his chakra bursts around his body looking like brown flame. Shit. Inoki cursed. Ninpo. Chikik no Ketsum, ninja art. Bond of earth. He said as he raised his left arm, a rock arm bursting beside him. Become one with mother earth. He bellowed as he swung his arms down, the rock arm doing the same. Ninpo. Santanka, ninja art. Acid permeation. Yudakata shouted as he blew a stream of acid bubbles at the rock arm. Ishikawa quickly made the arms to protect him from the bubbles, but saw that the rock being eaten away by the acidic property of it. That is a very strong acid. He complimented. Han. Contact Kokok. Inoki shouted as he clapped his hands together, and his oldest son along with the assisting Kirinin, leaped at the show Daimate Tsuchikage. Got it, pops. Han accepted as he clapped his hands together and closed his eyes. After a few seconds a white bubbly cloak seems to leak from his armor and cover him like a suit, two horse-like tails forming at the tailbone of the shroud. Snapping his eyes open revealing them to be a dark blue-green color he bellowed. I'm ready. Before he dashed at his revived grandfather while leaving a trail of steam in his wake. Rashi was knocking away boulders from left to right as his grandfather held his hands open. In his palm was a three-dimensional cube with a sphere in the center. Jinten. Genkai Hakuri no Jutsu, Dust Release. Detachment of the primitive world jutsu. He shouted as he stretched out his hands towards the target. Seeing this both Yudakata and Rashi leaped back spraying a torrent of bubbles and spray of lava respectfully to keep the targets focus them. Ichiokich Mayaku, one hill leap. Han cried as he stomped his chakra shrouded feet onto his village's revived Sho Daimei's skull, creating a large steamy explosion. He leaped up just in time for the reconstructing Kage to get trapped in a very larger version of the three-dimensional square around the target, with said target being inside the sphere. Looks like you got me, Inoki. The squinty-eyed Kage chuckled as he opened one of the optical organs. You did well. Make sure you keep the will of Earth strong and resilient. I will. The short old man nodded as he kept a strong expression while keeping back his tears. Ishikawa looked to his two grandchildren. And I've seen how strong you two became. He chuckled, his pink eye filled with respect. What of Katsuchi? He was sent on a mission before we left. Han responded, his chakra shroud receding back into his body. I see. The first village leader of Awagakur sighed and closed his eyes. Do your best, everyone. The road is long, but I know that you will succeed in what we have failed in. And then the cube glowed as his body began to disintegrate into atoms. Inoki gritted his teeth as a single tear leaked from his eye. Rest in peace, Shou Dai Mei Tsuchikage-sama. Wiping the tear he turned to the young Kiri Shinobi. Thank you for your help, Yudakata Dono. The tall man nodded back with a bow. You're welcome, Tsuchikage-san. Okay. Inoki nodded. Rashi, Han go help the Raikage. Yutakakata and I will help Hiruzen with that snake brat. Maria vs Natsuki, Shizuka, Juliet, Nina, and Erika. Shall we begin? Maria asked as she pulled her hair back over her left ear, revealing an earring that was dark orange and shaped like a tear. The jewel glowed and flashed brightly hiding her body in the light. Materialize. If one were to look at the earring, they would see the following. Name. M.G. Gem. Kao no Hekajoku, Eternal Recurrence Jasper. Connected. Master. Himeno Fumi. Robe activated permit, allowed. Start. What the group saw now actually shocked them to their maiden cores. Maria was now far younger than she was now. Her hair was blonde and was straightened down to her neck with a single strand between her eyes and another strand that stretched from her forehead to the left of her face, along with one strand that starts from the right side of her forehead to the back like an antenna. Daughter clothing's changed as well. She wears a white one-piece leotard-like sweet. The suit has gray shoulders with dark blue bars going over each and was connected to a collar with a red diamond over her throat around her neck. Her chest and cup cleavage was exposed through the opening in the front and slimmed down her body and waist. Her wrist, waist, and ankles have large ring bangles that were of the same design of the collar, minus the red jewel. 
Around her hips were four flowers like petals of white with a closed bee-like decor on each. From her back hangs a two-tailed cape that's white on the outside and purple inside. Miss Maria the group chorused, each having a face of shock and disbelief. Standing tall as she took a deep breath, the revived instructor looked at the younger warriors of her country. Prepare yourselves young ones. For I will not be lenient. She promised as she held out her right arm and summoned a meter and a half flat rapier, with the curved handles and bolt guards that was gripped in her hand. Mashiro raised her hand, the five rings giving a glow. I, Mashiro Burinda Windbloom, Queen of Tsumegakur, command thee. Let our deceased comrades return to their rest. Hi, Jom Sama. The five replied as their earrings glowed along with their respected rings. Materialize. Ara, Ara. Shizune smiled as her earring flashed a bright purple color. Name? SV. Gem. KYYLE and Nomurasakakasishl, the witching smile amethyst. Connected. Master. Mashiro Burinda Windbloom. Robe activated permit, granted. Start. Her clothes changed drastically as well. Her suit was purple and skin tight, but yet comfortable to move in. She has white frilled shoulder pads over a purple leader top that stretches over her upper torso down to just above her crotch area. She sleeves were long and sleek purple with bangles on each wrist, with a thin purple line. Her exposed cleavage was covered in a thin cold black material held up by a white collar around her neck. She wears skin-tight pants with ankle bangles and yellow lines going down to her knees along eight purple sashes hanging from the bangle around her waist. She wears a pair of purple mid-height heels that has a red diamond over the center. She also wears a two-tailed cap with purple exterior and red interior. Chiziru allowed a graceful smile on her face as she summoned her two-sided Najinata. Ara, Ara. I am honored to face you Meister Instructor Maria. Shizuru gave a short bow. Itsuki fixed her hair as her body flashed a bright silver-blue color, the temperature dropping a few notches. Name? NK. Gem? Hyosetsu no Ginsushl, I Silver Crystal. Connected? Master? Mashiro Burinda Windbloom. Robe activated permit, granted. Start. Her clothing changed as well. She wears a black leotard top with silver sleeves and black gloves with silver fingers, with two silver bangles with dark blue lines around her wrists. From her chest and around her frieze were colored black with three green markings on her chest area, between her cleavages is a diamond shape, while at her collar's bones were rectangles, while on her stomach were two red tribal symmetrical markings. She wears a sliver bangle around her hips with eight tails hanging from it just above her black legging, that leads down to her shin, where she wears silver female boots with heels. She wears a two-tailed thin cape with silver exterior, while the inside color is dark blue. Also on her right side of her head, she wears a silver hairpiece above her ear. Raising both her hand as cold mist gathered above her. The mists condensed and began to take shape, and the color changed as well. The item was gray and was quite large. The barrel being at least four feet in length while the rest being at least three feet. Two turbines-like protrusion were at either sides of the weapon at six inches away from the barrel. Going more back, a large boomerang-like shaped item were at the top of the turbines with a grip with a trigger connecting the top part against the top of the wide area. Below the trigger and leading to the back of the weapon, a large side view of another turbine can be seen, and a black oddly shaped edge with a golden end. Catching the weapon she aims the barrel at the revived Meister. Let's get this done. Juliet gritted her teeth. Name? JNZ. Gem? Hagen no Sinchilseki, break string spinal. Connected? Master? Mashiro Burinda Windbloom. Robe activated permit, allowed. Start. The redeed's earring glowed pale red, her body being consumed by the light. In place of her clothing was a lime green leotard with a yellow spider web design that forms from her shoulders down the middle of her top and ended just below her crotch area covering it, on the back the design reached to her mid-back. Just like the previous two she wears a bangle on her wrists, ankles and around her waist. She wears yellow gloves with green fingers and white high-heeled shoes with yellow needle-like design on the top. She has four blades hanging from her back, the shorter ones right below the nap of the neck reaching to her elbows, while the taller ones reach to her shins. Around her waist and down to her thighs, she wears a white skirt shaped like those of the Amazons. Raising her right hand, it shined and enlarged into a green golden clawed gauntlet with a large hole in the palm. The gauntlet points out to the length of her bicep. Let's go, Erica. Nina narrowed her eyes at the revived instructor. Name? N.W. Gem. Wadatsumi no Sajoku, Neptune Emrick Gem. Connected. Master. Mashiro Burinda Windbloom. Robe activated permit, allowed. Start. Nina's earring flashed a bright green flash. Her clothing changed to a sleeveless tight shirt with green shoulder ends that goes down, past her frieze and ribs, as the rest being white with a diamond opening, showing her flat stomach, along with a green triangular tip flap that leads to her knees. Over her chest is a blue four-pointed cross with golden wings. 
She wears a white knee-length shorts with blue fronts and shin-high shoes that are interlaces with green and white that leads down to her low heels, white shoes with green ends. On her back were two white fin-like protrusion from her shoulders, while two lint that lead to just above the ground. Her wrists, ankles, and waist are golden bangles with green glowing lines from her lower back are two green shin-length tailcoats. Holding out her right hand she summoned a weapon that has a six-feet staff with a two-feet blue two-pronged blade extending from the staff, the blades were pointed with the tip bent outwards from each other. The Bident. Quite an interesting weapon for an element. Maria commented. Hi, Nina-chan. Arelka saluted as her pigtails stood straight, her earring glowing a bright sky-blue color. Name. A-Y. Gem. SLT and no Sajoku, blue sky sapphire. Connected. Master. Mashiro Burinda Windbloom. Robe activated permit, allowed. Start. Like the previous four, Erika's clothing changed as well. She wore three colored top. The shoulders being pink and puffy reaching at mid-bicep length. The top was white and formed from her neck down and encased her frieze, a red four-pointed red star over her heart, with two golden feathers flanking the sides. Below her bust was a pink lower half daemon with a blue square on it. The rest of the suit that lead down to her weight is dark blue with pink sides. The sleeves are white that ended with a gold bangle and pink gloves with white palms. The golden bank key around her hips held six pink flower petal-like extension with white and blue edges, showing the front of the blue and white sided spandex pants she wears that leads to just above her knees. She wears a set of pink shoes with white markings that reaches past her shins with a gold crosses over her knees. Her hair now held in white upside down tringale with her braided twin tails emerging from the top corners. Holding out her right hand she summoned a double-edged sword that was blue and seemed to be made from sapphire stones held together by a 20-inch handle. Ready. She exclaimed as she twirled her weapon. Itsuki nodded as she held her gun with right hand as she fixed her hair behind her left ear. Mia Sir Viola, Garter Hines. She commanded. Hi, hi. Shizer said with a thin smile as she leaped back and stood before the young queen. I do not see why a long-rage type like you would be in the front lines. Maria inquired as she suddenly bursts forwards with inhuman speed, leaving trail of orange-colored glitter in her wake. But a foolish mistake nonetheless, Meister Kruger. She reprimanded as she swng her blade down, only for both Nina and Erika to block the blow from cutting the Kruger Odom's head in half. We'll see. The dark blue-haired young lady shouted as she aimed the barrel the revived Odom's head and pulled the trigger. Maria showed great spinal flexibility as she banned back to avoid the pale blue beam-like projectile that collided against the purple field, but her hold against the two younger female warriors slackened considerably. Nina, whose weapon that was at the front swing her bite into a wide down arc, hoping to get the older female in her stomach. Throwing Maria's body moved on its own. Her right hand raising to block the bite into aiming to cut her in half. Her attempt was successful, but she had to move if she did not want to lose her head from Erica's sapphire crafted blade. Sliding back she stood up stray and posed her blade before her body, the blade glowing a pale green color. Hekijoku no KMGM no Heihin, Shards of the Jasper Empress. She said as she swung her blade letting out shards of jade stone fly in crescent formation towards the younger four. Isu Dangan SH plus Rudo, Ice Bullet Shield. Nastuki shouted as she shut shards of ice in front of her and her companions. The shards instantly bonded together and formed a rough ice shield blocking the shards. Nina. Erika. Juliet, she shouted. Right. The three shouted as they leaped over the shield and rushed towards the revived blonde. Erica swung low aiming for her feet as Nina swung high aiming for the head. Maria swung her rapier high, blocking the dark-haired Odom's bident while grabbing Erica's hand around the hilt. She nearly missed a retreat behind her ready to pierce her from th back. Letting go she leaped up followed by the three younger and her blade classed against the three other weapons. The four struggled against each other's strength. Wow, Maria-san, you're really strong. The Yumamiya complimented with a smile and her braids takes the form of a star as she ducked under a swing aimed for her head. Will I ever be as strong as you? She questioned. If you work hard enough and keep your training in check, then yes. Maria answered with a chuckle as she kicked Juliet's clawed gauntlet up and attempted to stab her, but was stopped Nina's bite in taking the blow. Really? She gasps. Of course. The white clayed revived woman stated as she finally leaped away from the younger generations to get some breathing space which she doesn't need because she's dead. Raising her hand as it gave a slight burnt orange glow, she shot five green beams into the air. Aim gafa hekajoku ai, raining jasper. Itsuki saw this and materialized a cartridge in her right hand and slapped it into gold piece of her weapon. Aiming up she fired. Buris do shado, blizzard shot. She yelled as her gun fire fragments of ice in the sky. She watched as most of the tear-shaped jade shards collided with her ice fragmented bullets. Erika, Nina, Juliet. Hold her back. I'm gonna load a cartridge. 
You sure you gonna use that? Erika shouted back as Nina dashed to the revived woman. I'm gonna use a smaller dose. Natsuki replied as she summoned another disc, this one being dark blue. Right. She nodded as she joined the free to helo her friend. Maria sidestepped a thrust from Nina's bite and swung her blade down at her. Thankfully it was blocked by Erika's jeweled weapon and was knocked back. She had avoid another claw thrust from the redeed, but she felt her arms being constricted by glowing red wires. Nina took the opportunity to swing her weapon in a wood arc, clashing it against the older woman's weapon once again. Erika. Jellied. Bosu. Said Odom shouted as her sapture crafted weapon glowed subtly. B U R K B O R U T O blue, bolt. She yelled thrusting the weapon forward and shooting a thin beam of blue color at Maria's chest, successfully blowing a fist-sized hole over her left freest, suppositely destroying the lung. Akasakitsui, red spine. Juliet shouted as she shot a red beam from the hole in her gauntlet and pierced through her lower back. Maria frowned as her body pushed forward despite the injury and clashed against Erika, her weight far surpassing the younger's. You are strong, Miss Erika. The revived woman commented. All of you. She stated as she raised her left hand and grabbed the staff from Nina's weapon. Stopping it in its track. Swinging Nina round, Maria struck the other Odom with her partner. She then turned grabbed Juliet's wrist and swung her towards Natsuki. Come on, come on, come on Natsuki muttered. Fuji shot. Set. Three. Two. I. Fire. Take this. Fuji shot oh, Fiji shot. She shouted firing a cotton ice bullet at the revived woman, missing Juliet's head by a fraction. Maria couldn't dodge the bullet in time and was struck in her stomach. Seeing Nina and Erica moving in to attack her uncle again she attempted to stop, but stop in mid-motion. Green-eyed widening she strained to look at her wound and noted that it was freezing. Not only that, but also seems to be spreading through her body. I see, she manged. Very well executed Atticmeister Kruger. She complimented it as her skin turned blue. Rest in peace Miss Maria. The blue-haired young woman prayed as Nina and Erica smashed her frozen body. A small group watched with mournful expressions as Maria's frozen head fell to ground and shattered upon impact. The last piece being the eternal recurrence Jasper glowing them faded before and crumbled to dust. Miss Maria. Juliet sighed as her claw clenched. I hope that she will find eternal rest. Mashiro hoped with a solemn look. I'm sure she will. Nina nodded. Okay. Natsuki began, but was interrupted by a blur flying past her crashing into the ground. What the hell? Juliet raised an eyebrow. Yuma versus A, B, Derui, and Kumo Kinoichi. A Sama. The young Kinoichi yelled to her village leader before she grabbed by B and moved out of the way before two thin beams of red light struck where she was. Now, now, Mabui. No time to get screwy. B rapped as he placed the younger female down and looked at the revived founder. Since that ring of hers glowed her clothes changed. Now we gotta make sure to stay out of range. He stated as he looked at the woman while Derry pulled his cleaver blade from his back. Yumi's clothes did indeed change. She now wears a white leotard suit with waist-length white cape and a feather-like crown on her head. High-heeled shoes were worn on her feet and her eyes were now yellow with red sclera. Looking down at the younger people before she gave a sad look. Forgive me young ones. She said as she held her hands out as if giving a staff of sorts. But I cannot fight this. She apologized as her weapon shimmered in the wind and remained invisible. Prepare yourself. She warned as two sets of angel wings spanning a ten feet each spread open. Mabui-san, can you get me behind her? Derry asked. I can try. The green eyes Kinoichi nodded as she went through a few hand seals. Derry stood ready as sparks begin to flicker around his body. Moments later he disappeared in a flash of black lightning and was instantly behind the winged woman with his blade ready cleave her down in two. Yumi simply stood there as she manipulated her upper right wing to block the blade with a clang. The three dark-skinned assassins looked in shock. Derry quickly regained his composure as ducked under the wing and swung low to her legs, only for the left lower wing to block it and upper left wing to thrust forwards and nearly pierce through his chest if he didn't jump back in time. What the tuck? He white-haired swordsman drawled. The founder's wings relaxed against her back as she turned her head to the Kumo swordsman. You will have to do better than that, young one. My wings are made from powerful material only found in my country. She stated as she quickly raised her weapon to block one of B's swords, which was gripped between his left elbow. Raising a brow at the strange manner of handling a blade, she ducked under another sword swing that was held behind the shade wearing Kumo Jonin's right knee. Such a strange and unorthodox manner of holding a sword. She mentally commented as she blocked a sword being held by B's teeth. She saw the young Mabui was going through hand signs once again. Recognizing them she prepared herself for either of the dark-skinned shinobis that would attack. She was not however prepared for her hairs to stand on, and the gathering of electricity was heard behind her. 
Raikage stood up with a groan as he was helped by a giggling Shizuru. Thanks for the help. He grumbled as he shook his head. You are very welcome. She smiled. Then nodded at her and looked at the other four women. Ha ha. You ladies are very strong. I like that. He stood tall, easily towering over the five. He raised an eyebrow at Erika when she owed at his height and her twin tails turning into a symbol. That's weird. He thought, but mentally shrugged it off. Looking at the gray-haired Kinoichi of his village he excused himself. Now if you'll excuse me. He raised his right arm and gathered a great quantity of ration chakra through it, causing his arm to spark. Within moments he vanished in a blue and purple lighting flash. Bashiro remained silent as she watched the two battles progress. Erika, Nina. Go assist Hokage Dono. Shizuru and Juliet deal with the serpent. Natsuki, you will stay by my side and use long-range support. Is that understood? Hi, Jom-sama. The five chorused. Bariado, Lariat. A shouted as he slammed his lighting element arm onto Fumi's back, causing her to crash onto the ground, bringing up tiles and dust from the impact of the blow. Araikage stood there painting as if he had a second match the legendary Kanoha no Kairoi Seng, Kanoha's yellow flash. We was immediately struck by lightning was now standing next to a panting Mabui he just slumped to her knees. Are you okay, Raikage-sama? She asked. The tan buff male nodded. I am now. Thanks Mabui. He looked at the enemy as she stood tall, the cracks and wounds giving to her healing. Once her wings were repaired she spread them wide. Thank you for stopping me. She gratefully said as she set herself in a battle stance, her stance looking rather weird, since she was holding her invisible weapon like a spear pointing at the quartet. But in order to defeat me you must destroy the tag inside my head, along with the rest of my body. She provided. Figured as much. Han sighed as he stepped beside the Kumo group, his brother right beside him. We'll have to make it quick, though. Yugura stated plainly as she stood with her hook staff in hand. Raising and slamming the large hook into the tiled ceiling. Nepich no Mori no Tatum, Rise of Neptune's Forests. Large groups of seaweed and planktons grew out the tiled places and were spreading like a virus. At the same time large trunks of wood and vines grew out into a large dense forest. What the hell? This isn't going well. B rapped as he leaped just as a shrub grew out at ab alarming rate. This is the show Daime Hokage's Mokuten Hijutsu. Jukai Kantan, Wood Release Secret Technique. Nativity of a World of Trees. Rashi said in awe as he along with his brothers, has been though about Kanoha's first leader. Looks like the semi-final boss battle stage is set. A grinned as he cracked his knuckles while standing on a branch. He landed next to his village leader with a grin. Right behind ya, bro. Now let's go beat that hoe. He rhymed. That sounded good. Derry drawled as he rests his cleaver sword over his left shoulder. Igura stood there as she pulled her staff out of a very thick branch. Let the show begin. She said as she leaped at the revived founder, hoping to gain her attention, while the others would get a clear shot at her. Gathering the available water particles she used them to make a water shunshun, and was behind the wing woman's left crouching low and ready to deliver a blow with small hook side of her staff. She was taken off guard when the revived founder of Tsumegakur instantly turned her head, her eyes green eyes locking with Yugura's non-pupil pink. Then Fumi's eyes turned to red as he sclera turned dark green. Her eyes glowed a burning red and fired a thin beam of red light towards the Kiri Kinoichi. Igura was lucky to have avoided the attack at the last moment, lest she wanted another set of eyes in her forehead. Holy shit she can shoot some laser. Quick someone gotta stun her with a tosser. B rapped as he dodged a set of optical blasts that was aimed him, preferably his mouth. Way ahead of ya. Derry frowned as he went through a quick session of hand seals. Clapping his hands together as black electricity gathered at his fingertips. Kurakazuchi no Dangan, black lightning bullet. He shouted shooting at ten shot bolts of lightning at the revived woman. Fumi leaped back to avoid the bullets with a flap of her wings. She had to move out of the way just as an ice shard bullet nearly pierced her left temple. But the bullet simply whizzed past her face. Glancing to the left her eyes sees Natsuki aiming her large gun at her. Frowning her eyes glowed once again. This time, her target being the Odom and her queen. The Odin. Maguma Hashira, Lava Release. Magma Pillar. Rashi shouted as a pillar of hot molten lava bursts from below the revived woman and was being burned by the intense heat. Igura landed a few feet from the jutsu caster. That was close. She muttered. Sorry about that. Rashi apologized as he kept his gaze and concentration at the ten-foot attack he's using and paying attention to the silhouette inside. Fumi raised her hand that held her weapon and swung cleanly through the magma pillar, cutting it down and thus disrupting the flow. The magma fell from the sky and began to burn the woods and plant. Take out the fire. We don't need more distraction than we already have. I yelled out. Nkai Shin no Denari, Steam God Bellow. Hand shouted blowing thick steamy mist at the growing flames. Suetin. 
Mizu Kumzui, water flood. Yagura took a deep breath as his cheeks bulged before spewing out a great amount of water. Fumi took to the limited sky to avoid flood that was rushing towards her. Landing on a branch her body gave a slight purple glow as she raised her weapon while cancelling the invisibility she casted on it. The weapon was a scythe that was at least six feet long. The staff being white while the two-foot blade was a dazzling silver color. Fumi allowed the energy that was around her body to flow through her staff and along her blade. Once the energy output was enough, she swung her blade down, sending a large crescent purple silver slash down the way. Shirab Megami no Sarasu, Silver Goddesses Slash. The group reacted quickly unless they wanted to cut down or lose a limb. Ayuyu closed her eyes as the founder's attack crashed near her position. Hey watch where you throw that thing you endia tucking bis. She ranted. Seiken simply chuckled. Maybe you need to get stronger. Fuck you, you two-headed beep sucker. The last thing I need is your tucking voice going through my ears. He landed on a small field along with others. This isn't getting good. And looks like we're far from out of the wood. He sighed as he placed the gray-haired Kinoichi to stand. We're fighting someone that managed to knock Raikage-sama to the side with a simple backhand, and your rapping isn't making the situation better. Mabui countered. What's the worst that can happen? He challenged with a shrug. Upon that sentence leaving his lips a seal appeared below them, and they felt the gravity increase by folds. What is this? Yugura struggled as she was on her hands and knees fighting against the increased force of the weight on her body. The challenging universe. Derui grunted. Fume raised her scythe-wielding arm once again and gathered energy to it. This time the energy expelled from her body and forming a silhouette of a woman holding an even deadlier-looking version of her weapon. Uchi Mikasa Jam no Hanketsu, Judgment of the Vanquished Queen. She claimed as the female aura figure raised her version of the scythe over her head. Forgive me, young ones. But this is the end. She said in a sad tone as tears began to leak from her eyes. You're right. It's over for you. A voice said. Yumi's body suddenly went rigid and stood straight like a soldier in the front line. And then her body simply lowered on a thick three branch close to its trunk. The group the pressure on them lessened and stood up with sighs. What just happened? Han asked while rolling his shoulders. I saved your life of course. The woman stated as she stepped from behind the three and stood next still standing woman. No need for you to end up on my father's list. Well not yet anyway. And who are you? I asked as he eyed the woman. The woman's hair was silver with black streaks and was tucked behind her pointed ears. Her eyes were dark purple with red slit pupils and sclera being black. She wears an open shin length obsidian colored robe that seems to absorb all light. Under her robe she wears a dark gray sleeveless shirt over her J-cup bust that stopped just above her belly button, showing her slim and flat stomach. She wears hip-hugging black pants that lead down to her knees. She's also not wearing any shoes. Showing her black toenailed feet. Hey there, mammy. Be worded. Sorry, kid. I'm already taking. She grinned showing her sharpened teeth. Now then. She poked Fumi's forehead and the founder dropped like a puppet with outer strings. I have great plans for you, my dear. She grinned. Excuse me, but who are you? Mabui asked. Ah yes. The woman smiled warmly at the young Kumo Kinoichi. My name is Jashin. Goddess of blood, destruction, and chaos. She introduces herself getting wide eyes from the group. I call bullshit. A rebuffed. Is that so? She challenged standing behind the Kumo leader with her black nails extended and poking his jugular vein while emitting a heavy dosage of Kai. If I wanted I could have killed all of you and fed you to my father. But, since you have a signed marriage contract with my fiancé and these two men here are the uncles of Kuritsuchi, you will live. She said in a deathly calm tone and a smile. Defy me again and you head will be on a pike while I torture your soul. Are we clear? Crystal. I sweated. Good. She smiled as she suddenly next to Fumi's body again. Now go help that old man so he can live a bit longer. She practically ordered prompting the group to go and assist the Hokage and their fellow shinobi leaders. What do you plan of me? Fumi asked as she looked at the standing goddess. Dashin only grind as her hand reached a downed revived woman. Orohimaru, Hashirama, and Tabarama vs. Hiruzen, Tarumi Mei, Inoki, Yudakata, Shizuru, Juliet, Arik, Nina. Orochimaru was actually enjoying his show when watching his older sensei fighting against his even older, but younger looking senseis. Of course he was just grinning like a loon when his ex-home second leader spew a great quantity of water at his former sensei, and it was blocked by a mud wall, the third spat from his mouth. His grin grew wider when Hashirama was beside the aged man and socked him in the face with a well-aimed fist to the jaw. The Saratobi elder leaped back after recovering from the fist to the face tactic and went through a few hand seals. Doton. Doric Taiga, Earth Release. Earth Flow River. 
Seeing his revived senseis were caught in the mud flow that he spew out, he went through another set of hand seals and held up a Taurus sign while inhaling a good amount of air. Caden. Correctin. Fire release. Fire dragon bullet. He blew a stream of fire that flooded the mud into two captives. That's no you sensei. Orochimaru taunted as the fire died down and the regenerating Kage break out of their rocky-like prison. You cannot defeat the ones that are already dead. He chuckled. Hashirama be a good boy and make a small forest for me please. He grinned. The first Hokage gritted his teeth as his hands moved and formed a sequence of hand seals. Mokuten Hijutsu. Jukai Kentan, Wood Release Secret Technique. Nativity of a World of Trees. Trees of abnormal sizes began to grow at a rapid pace, turning the purple barrier filed into an unnatural garden. Garazin leaped up and landed on a thick branch too would support his whole team if her were in his younger days. You will fall today, Orochimaru. He promised. The snake sang and chuckled as he leaped up and landed on a branch a few meters away from his sensei, the two previous Hokages beside him. I don't think so, sensei. He sneered before his mouth opened widely and a white snake came out. Said serpent opened its own mouth and a long sword came out. The sword was a double-bladed edged one and has a gold bar curved guard with a green jewel in the center. The handle being black with a round pummel at the bottom. Grabbing the hilt of his weapon he gave an experimental swing, cutting the tree behind him. Well, sensei. Are you ready to meet your end? We'll see. The elder Kage leveled shinobi challenged as he went through a short sequence of quick hand seals. Stop him. He ordered the two revived leaders as he along with them leap at the aged man. The three being stopped as Hashirama got a head shot from an ice shard, Juliet grabbed Tabarama's face and slammed him against a tree, while Shizuru swung her Najinata that extended in a serpentine manner at the pale-skinned man. The Sandin was pushed back as he had to avoid a rock spike rising from the ground and a blob of magma that nearly took his head off. We're here to assist you, Hokage-san. Nina stated as she stood protectively before the aged man along with Erika. Don't forget about me. Inoki interjected as he and Yudakata landed beside them. Well Inoki was floating. Besides I don't really want to be only old Kage alive today. He grinned. Looks like a snake need his head cut off. Mei smiled stepping besides her fellow village leaders. Let's get this over. A commented with a scowl. Thank you. All of you. Hiruzen smiled as he slammed his hand onto the large branch. Kuchiya no jutsu, summoning technique. He yelled before a large puff of smoke bursts from the formula that stretched over the bark. A monkey whose body and tail is covered by white fur which protrudes from his sleeves and pants. He has long unkempt white hair that reached into his back and long sideburns and a goatee. He wears a black suit with mesh armor underneath, over which he wears a sleeveless kimono shirt with white fur trimmings and markings reminiscent of tiger stripes on it, which is held closed by a red sash. He also wears a kanoha forehead protector. Enkma. Enma, Monarchy King. Enma. The taller primate knelt before his summoner facing the snake Sanon who was still avoiding Shizuru's Najinata. So you finally decided to finish that brat off, Hahirazan? He questioned. The aged Hokage nodded. Indeed I am old friend. This might be our last battle. Planning to kick the bucket after this? The primal summon chuckled. Maybe. He answered with a small smile. I am in need of a successor. He thought. We'll decide after we beat that snake. My wife's been begging for an albino snake purse. The monkey boss summoned chuckled. Then let's make your wife one happy woman. Hiruzen stated as he placed his hand on his friend's shoulder. Henge, transformation, he began. Hong Naioi, Vajra Naioi the monkey king finished after forming the ram sign and was enveloped in a thick plume of smoke. Hiruzen swiped his hand through the smoke and grabbed a nine feet black staff with gold ends. Your time has come Orochimaru. Orochimaru managed to leap away from Shizuru's onslaught and landed a good distance away. This is very annoying. He commented. His head snapped to the side once he sees his three-headed snake summoned, got stomped by a giant frog with what seems to be a card on its back. Sighing he passed his hand through his long hair. Tabarama. Tabarama scowled as his hands moved at their own accord. Mizubunshin no jutsu, water clone jutsu. After creating the water elemental clones of himself, each formed the hand signs in sync. Suitan. Sudanha, water release. Water severing wave. They yelled as each clone alone with the original shot a thin stream of pressured water at the opposing shinobus. They avoided being pierced by the thin water beam as Hashirama landed on a branch and went through a few shorthand signs. Mokuten. Makurik no jutsu, wood release. Wood dragon jutsu. From the tree below him a large western dragon made from wood coiled out of the three and was roaring towards them. May retaliated by shooting a large glob of lava alongside Rashi, who shot a stream of the molten element and clash against the wooden dragon. But the now burning dragon kept going even if its momentum was slow. 
Butakata along with Yugura and Derry formed a triple combination of Suetan. Ja no Kuchi, water release. Snake's mouth, forming a large snake head of water that managed to swallow the wooden burning dragon and doused the fire making the creature wooden body brittle and crack. It would have gone further if Juliet did not smash it with her enlarged clawed gauntlet. Abarama landed besides his brother and went through a string of hand seals. Suetan. Suetan. Surakumbaku no Jutsu, water release. Water dragon biting explosion Jutsu. He claimed as puddles of water appeared below the Horai Mizu and Chuchikage that sent torrents of large water streams towards them. Irizin leaped up as he twirled the transformed Enma like a motor blade blocking the water bullets. As he sees a thin dragon with menacing red eyes and seems to made from pressured streamed water heading towards him, he held the staff up and simply smashed the water dragon's head with a mighty swing, blowing he head off and cancelling the attack. The gathered his rash and affinity around his body, creating his infamous Raten. Chakuram Do, lightning release chakra mode that he created to match B and face the Yan Daime Hokage in his younger days. He was punching through the water bullets despite the fact that water conducts electricity he was not being harmed. He grinned as he saw the dragon roaring right towards him and he rushed towards with a yell, smashing right through it in a tree. Moment later he used his enhanced speed to appear before the pale-skinned man and swung his arm at him. Kaminari Gar Ariado Ohishutsu Shai, lightning discharge Lariat. He yelled before his arm sparked highly releasing a great quantity of electricity before impact. He grinned widely as he managed to hit the Kanoha trader in his stomach and sent him soaring through the trees. NGOJ. Orochimaru Sama. Seiken yelled to his master. Concentrate you dumb tuck. Ta Yu Yu yelled as she felt the barrier fluctuate. You want all of us to die I don't tucking think so. Keep the barrier up until Orochimaru Sama says so. Kitamaru gritted. NGOJ. May and Inoki used the earth element to block the water bullet, and also the dragon came after it. Inoki was knocked back and was hurtling towards one of the trees, but Han managed to catch him before he crashed into it. Thank you Han. The old man said to his son. No problem, pops. The red armored man muttered. Hirazin landed besides the two and frowned. This battle is taking too long. Hirazin complained as he watched the Chunin field being demolished by the Ichibi no Tanuki and the giant of wind fighting against Naruto and his comrades, while they also try get the trap struggling Ichiha out of a barrier made from sand and wind. Any idea, fireman? Cause we need a good plan. Be wrapped as he landed besides the trio. I have a plan. The Siratobi elder sighed. Nina-san, Erika-san. Hi, Hokage Dono. Nina answered as Erika kept an eye out for the slippery serpent. I want you and your fellow soldiers to hold Orochimaru at bay while I prepare a powerful jutsu. He stated. I the two acknowledged as they leaped to find the snake Sanin. What are we going to do? I asked as he looked at the aged leader. All of you including the queen and her bodyguards are leaving. He said as she slammed his hand onto the ground, a barrier appeared around each of the respected leaders of their villages and countries, along with their bodyguards. What's this? Nina asked in shock as she tried to pierce through the barrier with her bident. I'm trapped. Erika yelled. What are you doing old man? I yelled with a growl. No need for you to die in this fight. Hirazin smiled at them. I must end this myself. He stated with resolve. Space-time ninjutsu. Mujitsu no Yuri Kago, Jiken ninjutsu. Cradle of the innocence. He yelled knowingly transporting them to the bunkers. That took a lot out of me than I expected. He muttered to himself. Are you with me, Enma? He asked the monkey king. An eye opened at the end of the staff. I'm with you all the way, Hirazin. He claimed before he closed his eye. Good. He nodded as he performed a single jutsu to jumpstart his plan. Kage Bunshin no jutsu, shadow clone jutsu. He yelled out as five clones poofed into existence, making sure to add enough chakra so that his living copies can take a B rank jutsu and still be able to function. You know what to do. The clones nodded and made their way towards their targets. Now. Hirazin prepared himself as he along with his three went through most possibly the last hand seals to the jutsu he planned to use in his life. Snake boar ram rabbit dog rat bird horse snake clap hands, shikif jin, dead demon consuming seal. Upon the mention of the technique a black spectral portal swirled open behind the San Deami Hokage. A translucent gaunt specter with a demonic visage. It is much larger than an average human, possessing long, shaggy white hair, from which two red horns protrude, and purple colored skin. It is draped in a large white garments and carries a set of prayer beads wrapped around its left hand. Within its mouth is a tanto that's barred by his sharp teeth. You who have summoned me, the Shinigami. What is your desire mortal? The price of what you will pay is your soul. He guttered out despite the sheathed weapon in his mouth. I, Saratobi Hirazan Erbi offer my soul to seal the souls of Senju Hashirama, Senju Tabarama, and Orochimaru of the Sanin. Very well. 
The specter chuckled as he stretched his left arm into the aged man's back, along with two additional one into the backs of his clones. You have a strong soul young one. I will accept your offer. The white-haired being agreed as black marking spread from his hand into Hirzen. The San de Ami Hokage and his clones were gritting their teeth when the ruler of Makai latched to Hirazin's soul. I need to make this quick. He though as he along with his remaining clones, leaped to find their targets. It seems like you're doing well even in your old age, Hirazin. Tabarama commented as living student's clone as he ducked under a swing from the Enma form staff that was aimed for his head and thrusts his left hand forward towards the copy's chest with a thin layer of suit and chakra. The clone seeing this quickly leaped over his original's revived village second leader and held him in a full Nelson. The revived blue-clad leader struggled against the hold of his living student's clone. He suddenly stopped as a fist slammed into his left cheek and felt two other arms around his torso. Red-eyed meat brown as he felt a hand plunged into his gut through a rip in the San de Ami suit around his stomach area. Abarama shook violently as he looked down and seized the blue spectral hand slowly pulling his soul into the assisting clone. I see. He allowed a small smile on his face as he watched the determination on the San de Ami's face. You've done well Hirazan. He congratulated his loving student before his body began to break apart and the pieces simply turned to dust and ashes, revealing the body of a child about seven years of age. The copy of Hirazan sweated as he pulled the soul of his creator's sensei into him. Releasing his hold and clapped his hand together. Fuin, seal he yelled as a seal appeared on his stomach, indicating that the technique was a success. The clone that sealed away the clone of Tabarama gave his fellow clone a nod before dispelling, sending the message to his others to know that he has completed with his task. Ashurama sent a stream of wooden posts towards the charging clone. Seeing the clone was dodging the wooden attack and occasionally smashing some of them that got closer to it, he added more chakra into his attack and sent tendrils of wooden spikes. You've become really slow in your age Hirazan. Ashurama grinned as he leaped up onto the branches to meet his student halfway the wooden parted bridge. I have my lifestyle to thank, Sensei. Hirazan confessed as he leaped at his undead teacher and swung low with his staff. Ashurama leaped off into the air just as the staff was below his feet and felt himself being pulled by a powerful grip around his ankle. Hirazan grinned when Enma's arm stretched out from his staff from and grabbed his sensei's ankle. With a grunt and a movement of his arms, he slammed the village's first leader repeatedly through several branches and making sure to break the bridge that they were on. Using the fall as a momentum, Hiruz began to somersault with Enma's grip still onto the village's creator and making sure the speed was enough so that Hashirama would not be able to properly preform hand signs. Nearing the bottom and also getting a bit dizzy Hiruzen's clone swung with all his might and slammed the Shodaime Hokage with a thunderous crash onto the tiled forest floor. The body of the Shodaime Hokage did not get the chance to move since the clone that was meant to seal him slammed down on him with a double knee drop onto his gut. Quickly holding the show Dai Mei down the clone allowed the Shinigami's ghostly hand to break through his armor and latch onto the Senju founder once the hand entered his body. Yuan, seal. The clone yelled as the hand pulled the soul of his creator's sensei into him, forming the seal on his stomach. Ashurama simply gave a friendly grin with closed eyes before his body crumble, revealing the now dead Odo Kanoichi that was used for the sacrifice. The clone panted as it finally dispelled. The first clone caught up to the second. The two nodded and leaped to the third clone to assist it. The third clone landed in a small area on the roof where he saw his creator's wayward student crashed after being knocked from A's attack. He neared the crash site holding the copy of the Monkey King in his grasps. He felt a tingle go down his spine and managed to duck just an extended sword that passed the place where his head was. He leaped up and landed on a branch away from the rubble of woods that the sword extended from. His eyes narrowed as the sword shortened and seeped into the small crack of the wooden cave in. Orochimaru pushed some of the logs that were weighing him down, with a groan mixed with a chuckle. I'm so glad you came to see how I was doing sensei. He sneered as he held his blade to the side. But would you really be here instead? He quizzed as he frowned. This ends now Orochimaru. The clone preached as he twirled the staff and pointed one of the ends at the renegade s rank Nuknin. Come now, sensei. The pale-skinned man chuckled. Your age must be infecting your brain. He mocked. Do you truly think that you can beat me? I don't think. The clone said before the two other clones appeared by his side and attacked the black-haired man as he himself leaped at him. I know. Orochimaru ducked under the first swung of the clone as he blocks the staff from the second one with the Kusanagi blade. Seeing the third clone ready to slam the Enma clone staff form unto him, he kicked the first clone's head and was rewarded with clone dispelling and jumped back from the attack that dented area where he once stood. Scowling at the fact that the clones were being a challenge to him, he swung the blade horizontally as he extended it length to reach the clones. With a joint effort, the two Hirazans blocked the Kusanagi blade with the staff form. Be careful. 
Even if I am a clone and in this form that damn blade can still hurt me. They heard one of the clone rods warn prompting the two clones to simultaneously push the blade up with enough force to stagger the wielder. Orochimaru did indeed stagger since he was not anticipating that would happen. Hiruzen took the chance to smash the Kusanagi wielder on his left shoulder and succeeded in the move since the pale-skinned man cried in pain once his left shoulder popped out of place. The snake sand and dropped the weapon from his right hand and was kicked away by one of the clones. The attacking clone along with the second proceeded to hold him making sure to hold his arms and hand in place so that he would be able to make any hand seals. Hiruzen panted as he made his way towards his struggling student and placed his hands upon his shoulders. Orochimaru stiffened once he felt his old sensei placed his hand on his shoulders. His eye widened as he felt the cold chill go down and up his spine as he sees the visage of the Death Reaper. No. He growled. No, 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 no. He chanted as he struggled against the hold of the three. You will not defeat me you senile old fool. I will be immortal. He screamed as he managed to struggle more. Both of us will die and we can fight all our eternity in the Shinigami's stomach. Hiruzen claimed a spectral visage of himself appeared before the Shinigami. The being proceeded to plunge his hand into the visage as it came out of the caster's stomach and pierced into the snake Sanin's own. I can't let it end like this. I won't let it end like this. Orochimaru mentally exclaimed as he kneed the left cloned into the gut with enough force to expel it, freeing his left arm from its prison. Seeing his blade a few meters away behind his sensei, he sent a line of chakra strings towards the tip of the blade and pulled hard. Enma seeing that his summoner and friend was in danger released his hinge to stoop the blade from piercing Hiruzen. Hiruzen felt his instinct telling him to dodge, but ignored in hoping to succeed in sealing his wayward student. He then suddenly felt his body jerked forward ever slightly and looked down to see the Kusanagi blade sticking out of left lung. You're going to die sensei. Orochimaru grinned as he began to sweat. Before you can even seal me. He then began to pull the blade. Should Hiruzen. Enma gritted his teeth as he held the blade of the long sword as it slowly slipped from his hand more into his summoner's body. Hurry up and seal that asshole. He gritted before he poofed away in a plume of smoke back to his home. Hiruzen hacked a glob of blood as he struggled to hold the technique. I might not be able to seal you away. The San de Ami Hokage admitted as he felt his body weakened. But I know what I can take from you. What are you talking about you fool? He yelled. Just hurry up and die. He snarled as he continues to pull until he felt an unholy amount pain in his arms. Screaming in anguish he looked down and sees that his arms were turning into a brown color and losing strength, but the pain increased as he attempted to use them. You fool. What have you done? I've decided to take you arms, Orochimaru. A fitting payment to wanting so much power. Fuin, seal. He yelled. The Shinigami removed the tanto from his teeth, revealing more of the sharp jagged teeth and a very long almost serpentine tongue. The offer is acceptable. He voice echoed to those connected to the technique. He swung his blade down and cutting through the link. His maw opened wide as he inhaled both Hiruzen's soul and Orochimaru's soul arms. Seeing that his deed is done he vanished. Give me back my arms, you fool. He yelled as Hiruzen slipped back and fell on his back, the blade fully protruding from his chest. Give them back or I'll stomp you to death. Hiruzen laid there on the ground as blood slowly leaked from his lip. He looked at his student as he continues to yell at him. Blinking his eyes, the last thing he saw was a child with pale skin, yellow slit eyes, and purple marking around his eyes smiling at him. Orochimaru panted as he saw his now dead sensei closed his eyes with a small smile on his face. Ra. He yelled as he kicked the dead man's side grinning in sick glee, after hearing a rib or two cracked. Taking a deep breath he opened his mouth as allowed the white snake in his stomach to creep out and devour his sword to bring it back into his body. We're leaving. He yelled to his bodyguards who undid the barrier and rushed towards him. Orochimaru-sama, are you alright? Seiken asked as Jirobu held the left side of his leader, while Tayuyu held his right. Of course not, you dumbass. Tayuyu yelled. His tucking arms are gone to shit. Stop your prattling and get me away now. He ordered. The five were making a run for it, as three Anbu ninjas were hot in their tail. Hitamaru's cheeks bulged as he began to chew whatever he has in his mouth. Done with his chewing he spat a glob some white sticky subtins and threw them at the masked ninja. The closest pulled out his ninja too and swung down on the deformed flying glob. Once the blade made contact with it, the glob exploded and wrapped around two of the Anbu units, leaving the third to give chase at the enemy. Horo, eat. The sound elites along with their leader heard a woman yell. Holy tucking shit. Tayuyu yelled as she watched the mouth filled with teeth heading right towards them, she estimated that the mouth was big enough to take all three of them in one bite. Seiken grunted as he successfully pushed the three out of the way and used a quick kawarimi to switch places with the remaining Anbu. The last thing the Anbu was depths off the mouth. 
Kitamaru watched as half the mask ninja was chomped off by the mouth, while the legs simply fell to the ground below. He watched as the mouth shrank and saw that it belonged to a small two feet high stubby feet and arms bipedal white dog-like thing with black beady eyes, floppy brown ears, a large horizontal oval shaped nose, and a large collar around its neck just below its now thin line mouth. Before he can say anything about it he felt his upper and middle left arm being cut off by a wide pale yellow oval shaped beam that came from his two o'clock position. Ah. He screamed as he instinctively shot two globs of goo at the stumps and kept on going along with the others. You will pay, Kanoha. You will pay. Orochimaru promised as he and his guards managed to escape the village and get into hiding. NGOJ. Bullet and Ami vs. the Three-Headed Serpent, before it was crushed. Bullet and Ami landed in the vicinity of the three-headed summon that was trashing about and killing shinobi left and right. The ninja landed by them. You too. Leave the premises at once. All civilians are to find refuge inside the bunkers. He yelled before a stray kunai founds its way into his throat. The high shadow reward didn't even bat an eyelash at the gurgling human. Pathetic. Ami scowled as the ninja were hard pressed to fighting the cream colored boss sized snake. They are shinobis and yet have problem facing this thing. Placing her hand on the ground she summoned a few s reivors. Take the survivors and wounded and get them out of our way. Their uses are done. The reivor closest to her nodded and the rest proceeded with their given tasks. Not all of us are supernatural like you, Ami. Bullet drawled as she picked her ears with her left pinky. Flicking a piece of dirt out of her nails, she punched her right fist into her left palm. But that's not stopping me to having a good fight. She yelled as she rushed towards the snake with Ami right beside her. She leaped up and with a wide grin, smashed her right gauntlet onto the lower belly, few feet off the ground, of the large snake, and stopped it in its track. The summon stopped its cavity since it felt itself being pushed back. The middle head raised a bulged eyebrow while the left head looked down and see Bullet looking up at it with narrowed eyes. Come on you big slug. I got some salt for you assless tail. The three heads seems to have gained a tick mark on their heads as they slowly descended towards the tan skinned busty woman. The six pale yellow eyes lock onto the golden eyes in a stare off. Seconds later in roared in her face ending foul smelling wind, parts of eaten victims, a kunai that was stuck between its teeth, and a bird. Bullet's reply was a simple hard jab to the summoned middle head's nose. Hard enough to send the head back like it was smacked by a certain blonde woman, and the two other heads whipped back along with it. Ami was running along the spine of the serpent and leaped up. She came down with her nails extended and melded like a long claymore. With a silent grunt she swung down on the left head, carving a deep and vicious scar down the right eye, and was rewarded with a hiss of pain and anger as it trashed its tail about and smashing unoccupied houses and buildings. Bullet leaped onto a building and jumped off the wall, just as the giant snake's tail crashed there. Beeping her left arm back and feeling the gears in her large wrist gauntlet turn she delivered a heavy knockdown punch to the center head of the beast, knocking it down with extreme force. The three-headed beast's center and left head shook their head with pain as the right one looked around for the two weak females that hurted. It felt four taps on each of its heads before it can move, the summon felt two fists impact atop of their skulls and sent them down with a large crash. The two bullets and Ami on the left and right head poofed away in smoke while the originals remained on the middle head. Let's finish this little shit. Bullet grumbled feeling like she wasted her time. She raised her left gauntlet and the size enlarges as a pressure pump extended from behind it. Ami nodded as her right fist turned blood red and grew large enough that she can hold and or crush a child's whole body. The two raised their fists ready to finish off the summoned, but they noticed a shadow growing bigger and bigger. Looking up they scowled at what they saw before leaping a good distance away from. Guchius. Yat Ikuzashi no Jutsu, summoning. Food cart destroyer Jutsu. They hear a man shout as a 20-story high toad crashed onto the summon's head, crushing them in the process and the body poofing away to its realm. Haha. Do not fare, people of Konoha. I the great Jiraiya Sama of Mount Momboku has arrived. Jiraiya is a tall man with waist-length spiky white hair usually tied back into a ponytail, with two shoulder-length bangs that framed both sides of his face. He also had red lines that ran down from his eyes and wore a horned forehead protector with the kanji for oil superscript Wanabura, which denotes his affiliation with Mount Momboku. He also had a noticeable ward on the left side of his nose. Ureya wears a green short shirt kimono and matching pants, under which he wore mesh armor that showed out of the sleeves and legs of his outfit. His outfit was completed with hand guards, a simple black belt, traditional Japanese jetta, wooden sandals, a red heiori with two simple yellow circles on each side, and a scroll on his back. He also had a tattoo in his left palm. He stood on his left leg as he rolled his head counterclockwise, his dark coal eyes going around with emotion. Holding his left hand forward while his right arms was out by up sideways degree, he hopped to the right on the toad's head. 
Before he can continue his strange dance he struck to his knees by an angry bullet who began to crack her knuckles. That was my kill, you mother tucker. She growled as her left eyebrow twitched. Ow the man whimpered in pain. What the hell was that for? He asked as he raised his head to look at the damn beautiful, busty, woman standing over him. Well his eyes were locked onto her freests. Hello my flower. He said from the toad's head. I got a boyfriend, and I will bust both of your nuts if I ever find the smallest of details of me in that book of yours. She threatened. The man simply groaned, still recuperating from the blow to his man bits. Anashimi kara nikishimi kara keiko o hakizaretashite. Dare mogami nakizu o kakushi magaki kurishimi tachayagariyo, drag the past out from the hatred, from the sadness. Everyone has scars to hide, struggles and hardships to overcome. Hazama was singing softly as she stood upon a pile of dead Taki, Suna, and Odo Nins, while twirling her butterfly knife. Hothit was a good warm-up. She sighed as she hopped off the corpse hill. Now then. She grinned widely. How about some info, hmm? She beeped her head to the side. Before her were three shinobis, one from each of the invading force. Tied by her green-chained serpents in a crucifix manner. You won't get anything from me, you biss. The Suna Jonin snarled. His left eye was slashed out, and his lips were busted. I fought from thing Febers and info. With you Vuf we Shinto Fi fans his sentence was cut short by a scream escaping his lipless mouth, a butterfly knife was lodged into his crotch courtesy of Hazama herself. Shut up she whined as she opened her left eye, slightly revealing brilliant yellow snake-like eyes that holds madness. Or I lend you. I already got rid of your unborn kids. Her grin threatened to slit her face in half. Now. She proceeded to swing her favored blade and quickly slit the Sunanin's throat. But the tuck. He didn't say anything. The Odonin yelled in shock. Who cares he doesn't know shit anyway. The green-haired woman retorted as she stabbed the Taki in in the gut and raised the blade up to his chest, allowing his innards to fall to the floor with a sickening splat. On the ground. You're on crazy piss. The Zama pressed her bloodied blade to man's throat, making sure it was deep enough to make the man bleed slightly. Her eye widening in maniacal glee at the fear the man was giving off. Raising the second knife to his eye she wondered. What would hurt more? Your throat being slowly slit or your eye being slowly gouged out. You seem to be having fun, Hazama-san. Jin stated as she stepped forward to the woman and her one scared to shit living captive. Ah Jin-chan. She smiled as she pricked the man's eye causing him to scream. It's been a while. It's only been a half hour, Hazama-san. Where's your sister? The older woman asked as she inspected the eye from the man. With Ragna Wani Sama at the moment. Well that's not good. She commented as she slapped the man. His screaming was getting really annoying. Be a man will you she yelled. Tuck it. She proceeded to lop his head off and made her way to the older twin. Let's go see how everyone else is doing. Weren't going to get information from that man. Jin asked as she walked beside the green-haired yellow-eyed woman. I don't care anymore. I'm sure hubby got some info. She smiled as she wiped some blood of her face. NGOJ. Well this is a lot more than expected. Naruto admitted as he landed on the stands with Kin, Karen, and Sakura, looking at the two Hanyu sisters trapped within their respected prison, he was also trying not to laugh at the captured Ichiha. Shikaku's eyes locked onto Naruto's. It seems that I have to deal with these brats before I have full control of this body. The giant Tanuki graveled. By that proclamation I can assume that you are not Shikaku, it should be no Tanuki. I bear the same name as the beast I possess at the moment, although it and the container are putting quite the fight. It chortled. I'm gonna assume that a seal is doing this. The QB offspring sighed. Karen, connect and search the area for two matching sources of chakra. If Gara and Tamari are being controlled by a seal, then the caster has to be close by. Sakura, Kin, get ready to attack the location of the caster. And what are you going to do, Naruto-sama? Kin asked as she pulled out several senbin between her knuckles and gathered lightning chakra through them. The QB Jinchuriki rolled his neck as he stepped at the edge of the stands and pulled out his blood red Nadachi, along with summoning his fox sword. I'm gonna deal with these lovely ladies. He smirked as his helmet folded over his head and clipped over his face. Chapter End. Alright that's it for today's video guys, let me know in the comments section how was the story, and also don't forget to like, share and subscribe. I will meet you in another video, peace out.